Good evening. It's somewhere around 6 o'clock, and so we'd like to uh, start the meeting. Uh, this is the June 11th Mashpee Conservation Commission meeting. We do have a full agenda this evening. We have a full list of, uh, of uh, commissioners as well. It's been a long time, uh, so now we are able to cover a lot of items, hopefully rather quickly tonight. Uh, so here's what I'm going to offer up to the commissioners. It's really not in regard to anybody else, but here's what we're going to do to try to move through these agendas. Rather than to jump with the commissioners, what we thought we'd do is to have a, a list that I will attempt to follow, listing the commissioners in order so that you know that if you missed your opportunity, you better get back in at your appropriate time. So starting from Dale McKay will be the first person I will call on to see whether they have questions, issues, and finally, when the when the debate is over, that's when we will then turn to voting and vote in this order or comment in this order. It'll be Dale McKay first, then Tom O'Neill, John Schwarzbach, Paul Colombo, Chad Smith, and myself, and Marty. I'm sorry, Marty, uh, I just moved you to another list over here. Apologize. You'll be voting as well. No, M Marty, so Marty, uh, Marty won't be voting, Ch uh, Brad. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I'm sorry. So, Mari will be doing a heavy listening. Uh, if, if you have no questions during the voting or discussion, and I should call on you, just simply say pass, and we'll move on and keep the, keep the meeting rolling that way. If we then go to the post-hearing, pre- or post-meeting uh, agenda, uh, Drew, you have a couple of things, I think, that you want to cover this evening before we get into the hearings themselves. Drew? Okay, so the um, have we officially called the meeting to order? Uh, oh, we always we always forget that. I apologize. <laughs> it is now slightly after six o'clock. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. Okay. Uh, so the first item we have on the pre-post agenda is uh, it's a discussion item on an extension request for uh, an existing permit. This is for 24 Seconset Point Road. This is a. Um, an undeveloped lot uh, that's been approved for a single-family home. And um, this is, uh, I'm not sure, I think it's the, the third extension request or second, the third extension request um, for this particular project. The reason I brought it up on a, as a discussion item is because when you've got so many years have gone by since the last time the property has been uh, delineated for wetlands, uh, or evaluated uh, by staff, um, it warrants uh, a discussion on, on what the commission feels moving forward. My own recommendation is at the very least that the wetlands be re-delineated, uh, and if that can be done in a time frame while the orders are still valid, you as the commission can uh, grant this extension, sign the extension, and we can hold it off until we receive that re-delineation. I don't know what the time frame is specifically, if that can get done. If that's not feasible, the next suggestion would be a submission of a new notice of intent. Um, it's just when you've got nine to ten years that have gone by on a lot uh, where nothing's happened, uh, to issue another extension at this point really warrants more information, uh, as I described. So, Brian or uh, Juliana, if you want to comment, uh, it doesn't matter which one uh, speaks about this, but. Um, Sure. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, good evening. I'm attorney Brian Charable. Uh, my house is in Marlboro, and I live in Winfield, Mass., on the North Shore. Uh, I'm joined by Mrs. Ferris tonight. She owns this lot at 24 Wisconsin with her husband, David. Uh, they've owned it since before 2010, and were the, they're the same title holder since when the orders and conditions were first imposed. Uh, we're before you tonight on two different orders. One relates to ability to build a, a septic system, and the other relates to a dock or ramp. As Mrs. Ferris can speak to, um, they had planned themselves to build on the lot, and then there was a plan a few years ago that uh, I think an aunt of David was going to be the one who built there, and, and she would become the title holder. And um, they had a plan for the work to be done this year within the most recent extension period, and were just delayed in March and, and February with some plans due to the virus. Um, I, I think that even one year, uh, extension would be enough for them at this point. And uh, Mr. McManus, to your point, I think that they'd be open to um, working to have the, the lines delineated again in their sense.
sensitive to that, and uh, it's been 10 years, so we want to make sure that they're operating in light of current conditions. Um, but I, I guess my only concern about the time frame is I think the first one of these extended orders would expire, I think, July 29th or 27th, okay. and the second one is late August. Okay. And so I just hope, it's, you know, it was like nobody could work, and then everybody could work, and so everybody was busy, you know, the folks that were working on sites. Um, and so I just hope we could get on somebody's calendar between now and then. So, as I said, uh, my my main concern is really getting the wetlands kind of updated as far as their delineation, um, and I think if we can accommodate that while uh, also being sensitive to the timeline, then you know um, I, I think we can move forward with this, uh, and that would be my recommendation. Um, you know, barring barring just how long it takes to get the delineations done, but have the extension permit uh, signed. And then, uh, you know, before anything takes place as far as any development, have that redelineation done. Um, the other uh, order, you know, can be extended, I think, without any delays. Uh, but the one, the one for the lot development should have that redelineation done. So if that's acceptable to the commissioner, if the commission has any questions, I'll turn it over to Brad and, and the other commission members. Thank you. Okay, here's, a, here's your opportunity. I will uh, attempt to ask people in a certain sequence here to see whether they have any questions in regards to Drew's recommendation. Dale, you're, you're number one, and if you would, give us your questions. thoughts if you have it. No questions. Sorry? No questions. Pass. Okay, moving on to Tom O'Neill. No questions. Tom? No questions. John? Uh, no questions, Brad. I would agree with uh, this recommendation. It makes a lot of sense to redelineate and extend. Okay. Paul? Uh, I agree with Brad's or Drew's recommendation. Do we have a certified wetland scientist uh, lined up to do this? That I don't know because this is all just uh, initial conversation. Yeah. I, I, yeah, so. I don't know. Uh, Anna, do you remember who, who did the original wetland delineation? I know that in the past we worked with uh, Cape and Island engineers. Okay. And Charlene over there might have been the person who helped us find the person to do that in the past. So I could reach out to her if that's helpful. Okay. Or, or if you guys have a recommendation of anyone. We do. We got a list that you, we can provide to you that has uh, qualified wetland consultants. Oh, that'd be great. Do you still have my email? I do, yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Chad. Chad? Chad, your audio might have cut out. <laughs> no question. And I support the uh, agent's uh, recommendation, so I will vote. Uh, I, will, well, I will call a vote of the rest of the commission, starting again with Dale. Your vote is? Well, I would, Brad, I would just articulate the motion uh, to approve this extension permit based on the conditions described. Okay. These extension permits. So moved. So moved. There's a second? I second. A second. Okay, now we'll come back to Dale. Dale, your vote is? Aye. And Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Uh, yes, pending the acceptance by Drew of the delineation. <coughs> okay. Chad? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So therefore, they are now free to uh, continue with this project as long as they uh, redelineate the, the resource area. How, long, how many do you have? Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. I don't know which one they're on right now. Thank, thank you very you. much. Take care. Have a great evening. You too. Thank okay, you. we'll move on to the 6 o'clock hearing of Susan M. and Kevin G. McCartney at 0 Melissa Avenue for proposed shed footpath 
grading and landscaping to remove and replace no. piers, stairs, landings, and a kayak rack. And Matt Costa from Cape and Islands will represent like the owners. Okay. This is an NOI. I just invited Matt to the meeting. He should be showing up momentarily. If everybody else who's currently waiting on the line for their hearing can mute their phones because we're getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. I don't know. Might be half an hour. Might be more. Okay. Good evening. Who's got Anybody some plans or pictures here? There we go. For the record, Matt Costa, Cape and Islands Engineering. Uh, representing the applicant tonight. We're here under a Notice of Intent application uh, to construct a, a elevated stairway down an inland bank uh, to a platform uh, at the edge of Mashpee uh, Pond and, uh, a, and uh, install a seasonal dock. Uh, your resource areas for this project uh, include uh, land under a water body, um, inland bank, and uh, this property is located within uh, natural heritage uh, endangered species uh, priority habitat. Uh, we did file with natural heritage and we did receive uh, no take determination uh, that should be in the file. Uh, this site has a an existing pathway that leads from Melissa Avenue uh, <clears throat> down to the water. Uh, as you can see in the plan that Drew has pulled up here, that uh, the path meanders uh, over the property lines, uh, then it heads towards the bank, uh, and then there's a set of landscape stairs that lead down the bank uh, to a dilapidated pier uh, area. Uh, we're proposing to uh, realign the path so that it's uh, located entirely on the property. Uh, that path will be placed uh, by meandering through trees. We're not proposing to remove any trees uh, for the path. Um, we're proposing a, to construct a set of uh, timber stairs uh, down the bank. Uh, we're going to realign where the path leads down the bank because a portion does uh, is located over the property line. Um, those stairs will be elevated above the bank uh, and the plants and natural root systems uh, will remain intact. The uh, work will be done by hand. Uh, the proposed pier is a seasonal uh, prefabricated pier uh, similar to other seasonal piers uh, that are uh, within the pond. Um, Addition to the stairs and the path uh, pier, we're also proposing a shed uh, that's located uh, through. Can you scroll back up there for a second? Yeah, there's a shed located right at the top of the of the bank, uh, and that will be for storage of uh, water-related items. Um, because the owner of this property actually lives down at 29 Melissa, uh, which is a good distance away. Uh, and the path is a good distance away from Melissa Avenue itself. Um, so the shed is, uh, will be very convenient for uh, storing materials. Um, it's a very basic uh, construction detail for the stairs you've all seen before. Uh, we believe this project meets the, uh, all the applicable performance standards as we have outlined in our our narrative, and we're respectfully requesting when you issue an order of conditions. Um, happy to answer any questions. Drew, can you add anything or you have comments? I'm just going to go over some of the photos of the site if anyone uh, hasn't been out there yet. So top left that you see here is uh, off of Melissa Ave. <clears throat> There's a sign, and just behind there, it's hard to see, but it's taking to show the beginning of the pathway going through the woods uh, to the left of this uh, in this image. The number that I called. And then, uh, uh, hold on one second. Uh, excuse me, if anyone's on the line uh, and you're not here, you know, your hearing isn't in progress, can you mute your phone, please? Uh, so the image on the right here is uh, approaching where the top of the inland bank and the existing steps uh, make their way down to the water body. Um, 
bottom left photo here, a uh, shot of the stairs going down to the shoreline, and then you can see the bottom right, again, the steps uh, making their way down to the existing um, floating dock, uh, kind of ramp area and storage of other components of the seasonal dock. So um, those are the uh, images, and as far as the performance standards, um, this is an undevelopable lot, so accessory uses are allowed under the zoning uh, regulations. Um, and as far as our regulations, how they apply, uh, our regulation for um, buffer zones and buffer strips, regulation number 29, does allow for, a, for an access pathway uh, through a buffer strip or a naturally vegetated area uh, to access the shoreline. And then going back up to the plan, four-foot wide, uh, you know, walkway going down the bank. The, um, the actual pier itself can't be wider than four feet, so that conforms to our dock and pier regulations. Uh, and then they are allowed to float uh, as well. Matt already mentioned about the natural heritage aspect. Um, for those commissioners, uh, new commissioners, Paul and John, um, most of the water bodies, the freshwater bodies here in Mashpee are mapped as natural heritage endangered species rare habitat because of uh, certain species of freshwater mussel. Um, so they go out and they evaluate any freshwater docks or any other projects that may impact uh, mussel habitat. Uh, just to give you a little background on what species uh, is involved here uh, and why natural heritage is triggered um, for some of these inland water bodies like Mashpee Pond. So they receive the letter from them so they are uh, good to go with natural heritage and everything else uh, proposed conforms to our um, applicable regulations. No other comments. Okay, commissioners, uh, let's start with Dale to see if you have any questions. Yes. Tom. I don't have any questions, thank you. Okay, John. No questions. Paul. Uh, I have one question. The uh, seasonal flow, whereabouts on the property is that going to be stored off-season? Matt, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's a fixed platform that's at the bottom of the uh, stairs. They would either be stored and strapped down on that, or they would be hauled out of the water and uh, stored at um, private property off-site. Okay. Okay. We can, we Chad? Can make, we can condition that. Yep. Chad? No questions. Okay, I have no questions either, so let's move on to a vote, unless I hear differently. Uh, the vote... It, Dale? Dale, your vote? Dale? Do we have a motion? Oh, yeah, we ought to have a motion. <laughs> the new commissioners realize that I sometimes forget to do the details, like calling motions. So, uh, do I hear a motion, gentlemen? This is an NOI. Motion to close that issue. Wait a second. Second. Okay, now we'll go back to calling the vote. Dale. Aye. Tom. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yes. Chad. Aye. I will vote high as well. So the motion has carried, and we'll move on from there. Uh, we will go to the 603 hearing of Jack Foster, Allison Poole Foster, and Lawrence C. Foster, as well as New Seabury Properties LLC at 31 Wheelhouse Lane, Waterline Drive North. This is proposed to hardscaping, landscaping, modifications to the addition, with additions to the dwelling, an extension of a footpath to platform with stairs. Matt Coster is still up in Cape and Islands Engineering. Matt, are you there? 
Yep, thank you again for the record, Matt Cross at Cape and Islands, uh, representing the applicant. Um, we're here under a notice of intent application for, as you stated, some various additions to the house uh, and to uh, install a 4 by 4 platform with some stairs on an adjacent parcel. Um, resource areas for this project include land under the ocean, uh, salt marsh, uh, BBW, um, and uh, coastal bank and land subject to coastal storm flowage. Uh, also, a portion of this property is located within an ACEC, uh, which is defined by a uh, contour boundary. Um, the additions uh, for the house, if Drew can scroll to the plan, are a few various uh, bump outs um, and changes. Uh, first, in the front, there's an addition that he's showing you there. Then we're moving around to the right side. We're going to have another addition behind the garage. Uh, and those are called out there. There's an existing uh, greenhouse in that area. Uh, and then behind that, there's an, a deck that's going to be extended off the existing deck uh, with a new set of stairs there. And all of that work is located uh, within previously legally uh, altered areas. Um, the Right now, the pool... Uh, patio is the closest uh, structure, uh, portion of the structure to the resource area. It has a zero setback to the coastal bank. Coastal bank is essentially at the edge of the patio uh, because that area is elevated. Um, the additions are not moving any closer to uh, the resource areas than what exists. Uh, also, as part of this proposal is the 4x4 four four platform that Drew's got the, the mouse on. Uh, that's located over in the adjacent open space parcel. If you uh, notice down below that, there's an existing ramp in bottom, bottom anchored float that's also located on that parcel. Uh, the purpose of this platform is um, to have the ability to have a ramp in bottom anchored float connected to it in the event that the harbor master in the future issues a permit for that. So in discussing this with Drew uh, at some detail, um, we, uh, at, upon his suggestion, uh, uh, we agreed that the there will be a special condition uh, for this platform that it will not be constructed uh, until such time that the harbor master does issue a, a permit uh, for that ramp and flow. Um, that being said, this project we do believe meets uh, all the applicable performance standards as we have outlined in our narrative, and we're respectfully requesting you issue an order of conditions. Uh, and Drew can uh, walk you through the photos. Okay. Um, sorry. Go ahead, Brad. No, I, I'm going to ask uh, as to whether you have any comments. You certainly do. Yeah, so I'm going to, and I'll do this for every hearing, I'll just take everybody through the pictures and then I'll give my comments at the end just so we'll keep the same uh, routine going. So uh, here you can see the front left, top left photo uh, of the garage and part of the front of the home, top right, the rest of the home, that's where some of the additions are going. Um, bottom left photo here, uh, that pine tree is growing right over the back of the garage causing some roof uh, issues. So that's a tree that's slated uh, to be removed where you can see in the plan here, uh, right here. So, uh, and then behind that is a greenhouse. Uh, regrettably, I didn't get a picture of the greenhouse. I must have just missed that part of it, but you can see the greenhouse is right behind the garage. Uh, and that's another uh, proposed uh, addition within that same kind of uh, footprint that the greenhouse is in a little bit, uh, little bit larger with some steps there. Um, so going back to the photos again, taking a look out at the, uh, at the resource areas, there's the pool and patio Matt had described that does go right up against the coastal bank. That's a pre-existing legally permitted condition um, for this particular home. Some other photos here. Uh, Top left, looking out again towards the direction where the pathway is going to be proposed to go out to that um, uh, that um, portion of the uh, the platform that will be ultimately uh, or eventually connected to a 10A ramp to a 10A float. 
And again, bottom left, just showing the stairs that go up. The fence right here, that kind of delineates the two properties, private property and then the uh, association land in the background. Uh, and then just another shot of the opposite side of the house resource area in the background. So um, getting back to Matt's description about uh, the 10A float, we had a discussion on, on these uh, types of projects where they come to CONCOM for the platform, uh, go to Harbor Master for a 10A float. 10A floats are exempt from the Wetlands Protection Act, so they have to go through the Harbor Master who issues permits for 10A floats. And then the two are connected via a ramp. Um, so in our conversation, we ultimately decided that uh, you know, this is going to lead to a situation where, we're, where the town is going to come up with a harbor management plan, uh, and at which time the harbor master, uh, you know, will, will uh, start to uh, issue tenant floats in these ACEC water bodies. So anyone who's not familiar with an ACEC water body, uh, it stands for Area of Critical Environmental Concern. And um, Wakoya Bay and all of its sub embayments like Jacob Pond, which you see here in the background, uh, are all under this ACEC jurisdiction. And the ACEC essentially says in a nutshell that you can't have structures below the ACEC line. Uh, and in this particular area, the species of primary concern is eelgrass. So um, given that restriction, uh, you know, a harbor management plan is really the right way to go for the town. Uh, and it'll help to kind of evaluate projects like this or aspects of overall projects that involve these platforms connected to 10A floats. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get to a point where um, these types of projects will uh, be part of a harbor management plan, so to speak. So um, Harbor Master is on board with this. I talked to Matt to discuss that there will be, if you were to approve this, all of this project, but especially the part about the platform, that the platform does not be constructed until all of this gets vetted out, and that would be a condition in the order of conditions. And if it means they have to keep extending the permit because we haven't gotten to that point yet, then that's what they'll have to do. But there would be no construction, uh, only a review of it and approval of it, and the condition would go into the order of conditions prohibiting construction until such time as everybody is satisfied uh, with this type of um, situation. And I know there may be some questions, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any, um, but um, as far as the home additions, uh, as was previously stated, they're all in pre-disturbed areas, and I don't see any, um, any, uh, anything about the performance standards that would be uh, adversely impacted uh, for these resource areas from those home additions. Uh, and the platform is of the same size and scope and, and dimensions that uh, conform to our dock and pier regulations, so there's nothing different about that either. So everything that's proposed, essentially, within our jurisdiction, uh, meets the performance standards. And uh, no other comments. Okay. Well, why don't we start again with Dale, if you have questions to follow up to Drew's comments. Yeah. Nothing. Oh, we'll move on to Tom O'Neill. No, I don't have any comments. John Schwarzbach. No questions. Paul Colombo. Um, I didn't see in the um, in the paperwork any work proposed for the pool. Is that not part of the project? Correct. It's just the additions that are shown. Okay. No, I'm all set. Chad. No questions. I have a question in regards to has the has the paperwork uh, carried forward so that uh, they can work uh, across New Seabury property lines? Has that been uh, taken care of? Um, yeah, we had uh, discussions with the uh, president of the association for this area, um, and they. Um, They, um, their position is that they have control of this area, um, and they have signed off on the project. Uh, they have reviewed everything, uh, and they signed the notice of intent application as well uh, for the work on that parcel. Uh, and that uh, Mr. Lloyd, I forget his first name, uh, or I think it is yeah. Lloyd. This is um, <laughs> yeah. He talked to Drew about this because there was some. Confusion between it, so I'm, I'm 
I'll pass it off to Drew. Yeah, so Brad, just to clarify, I did speak with uh, with Lloyd, who's the association president here, because you know part of this is going on to association land. So uh, the issue was that John Falacci, who has uh, taken over Joe Calisano's position, I don't think he was really aware of the history of some of these uh, turnovers of, of association land from the Seabury properties to the individual associations, and in this case, uh, Little Neck Bay Association. So. Um, based on the tax records, which Lloyd did provide, uh, it proves that they have officially taken over this area, and I think John Falacci just needs to be brought up to speed on that. Uh, I think he was just kind of being cautious more than anything in his uh, input, but they are, they're good to go as far as permission. Okay. Well, that's good because it's been confusion on that for many years, so to have it straightened out yeah. now with some of the new management out of the new, new Seabury, that's helpful. Yep. Okay. Uh, here, do I hear a motion? This is a NOI. Will be a close an issue. Um, I move to close that issue. <laughs> Go for it. Neil. Okay. Second. Can I hear a second? Aye. Second. Okay. Now we heard the aye. Okay. So Tom is aye. John, you're supporting. Uh, yes, I'm supporting. Paul? Yes. Chad? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion carries. Aye. <laughs> okay, so that, that takes care of it. We'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Is that your last so one, Matt? No, I got, you got one more. more. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be hanging out. Okay. All right. Uh, before we move on to the next hearing, Brad, I think it would be good just uh, for clarification if you designate a, a commissioner to make a motion and designate another commissioner to second the motion, uh, if they're willing to do so for each hearing, and that way we're not waiting for someone to make a motion and second a motion. Perhaps De uh, Chad can make a motion and Dale can second, uh, unless they have issue with that for a given hearing. No issue. Either one of them, they're, they're both good at covering it. So, yeah. Chad, you want to be, be honest to say the words? Sounds good. Okay, and Dale, you'll second. Yes. Okay, let's let's move to the 606 hearing. Jonathan Bernstein, 16 Papanesset Island Road, proposed demolition and reconstruction of a single-family dwelling, septic system upgrade with landscaping, hardscaping modifications, mitigation planting, at the request of the applicant, this has been continued twice, and the representative this evening should be Jeff Reed Johnson of Holmes and McGraw. This is an NOI. Jeffrey, Jeff, are you here? I think it's going to be um, Mike McGrath. Uh, I'm looking for Jeff. I don't think, uh, I don't see him. Can you hear me? We can, Mike. All right. Um, my name is Michael McGrath. I work for Homes of McGrath. We filed the uh, notice of intent for this project, um, which is uh, located on Pompanacetta Pompano Island Road across from Compass Circle. Uh, there's an existing single family dwelling there, and we're going to um, um, basically demolish and remove the existing single family house, and we're going to propose to build a new structure, um, a new uh, in-ground swimming pool, terrace, deck, porch, a D9 defined septic system where we're going to reconfigure the uh, um, driveway. Then we're going to do all the necessary work um, to um, uh, including grading and landscaping and we'll build in mitigation uh, buffer plantings. Most of the existing lot has already been developed so we're not going to alter um, uh, very much of anything in a natural vegetated uh, 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 system. So the new house is located no closer than the um, existing house. The existing house is shown as that dashed line. And the new house obviously is the one that's cross-hatched. To the south side or lower is the proposed pool and deck. And we did revise the plan pursuant to the discussions with Drew. Uh, we had it closer to the top of the coastal bank. The 
Uh, adjoining Pompanasset Bay, there's a salt marsh, there's a dune, a beach, a riprap, and then there's a, a regulatory coastal bank. There, this portion where the dwelling is is located entirely above the flood zone. There's a flood zone that's roughly parallel to Pompanasset Island Road and is labeled floodplain. So the new proposed structure is located entirely above the, uh, um, or in, um, uh, in land that's entirely above the floodplain. So the proposed septic system is a nitro um, denitrifying septic system, and we have filed with the Board of Health, and they have voted to uh, approve the installation of this denitrifying septic system. It's shown on the plan. Um, as far as you have certain regulations that describe that we have to put in mitigation plantings, and we have provided you with the calculations that show that we need to provide a total of 2,800 square feet of mitigation plantings. When we did the instrument survey and we did a historical plan file, there is a certain portion of a previously approved uh, vegetation that's up at the north corner that was not in existence. There, that's a requirement from an old order. So the bottom line is we are required to put in 3,495 square feet and we have 3,500 square feet of mitigation plants. And as I said, we agreed to set aside and preserve a significant tree that, um, um, that's down on the southern portion of the site, right, right in that area. So I believe that the proposed work conforms with your uh, regulations and it will not impair the, uh, uh, the physical stability of the existing coastal bank, nor will it affect the salt marsh. And I believe that um, this is an appropriate project. The mitigation plantings will enhance and protect the environment and the uh, resource areas. The... Um, um, I have um, three patents on denitrification, and we only will specify systems that work. The, we have we operate a couple of these nitro systems, and they do work. So that I believe protects the waters of Pompanasset Bay. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, Bro? Okay, I'll Good go bit. through. Yeah, I'll go through the photos. Um, Again, this is uh, 16 Pompanesset Island. <clears throat> Top left, looking at the home from the water side, you can see the, the coastal bank has been armored. Uh, it's been that case for quite some time, uh, fully licensed and permitted uh, revetment. Uh, there's the pine tree Mike was uh, referring to, and over here where you can kind of barely make out the staking there, but um, that's the area where the pool patio, that kind of triangular pool patio that you saw on the plan. Um, on the south side of the property. Originally they had that going out beyond uh, the existing footprint of the home and it necessitated the removal of this very large uh, white pine. So, and I, I, it was also within 35 feet of the coastal bank and under our uh, regulations, 35 feet is, whether it's predisturbed or naturally vegetated, is the absolute minimum uh, of encroachment. Uh, so when it comes to tear down rebuilds, it was getting into that 35 feet I met with Mike and, and uh, other folks associated with the project. Um, we had a discussion and they uh, didn't have a problem pushing that back, uh, that pool patio area back. I'll go back to the, uh, to the plan here to show you this, this triangular area here. This was out further towards the bank. Granted, it was going over grass and predisturbed area, but it was going to take out this tree, um, this tree right here. So that was the only part of the project that I had an issue with, and it was resolved, and you see it on, that, uh, on the proposed plan. Um, everything else, I think, shifts the house away from the coastal bank. It is an armored coastal bank, so as far as performance standards go, uh, it is not a sediment source uh, for downdrift uh, coastal resource areas like Coastal Beach and Coastal Dune. Its main function is a vertical barrier to storm damage, uh, and none of what's proposed uh, impacts that, in fact, it probably enhances it by supplying mitigation uh, in these lawn areas that you can see in the photos on the top left and top right. Then going down to the bottom photos, looking at the street side of the home, uh, there's the driveway which is proposed to be reconfigured septic uh, over here on the bottom left photo. 
uh, and then some additional uh, driveway and, and hardscaping work in the back. Uh, the back is mostly pre-disturbed. The, you know, the entire lot is pre-disturbed, um, pre-developed, and um, I think the modifications, generally speaking, uh, with the shifting of the home further from the top of the coastal bank and the addition of mitigation, um, provide a, uh, an environmental benefit uh, from the existing condition. And um, it meets the performance standards uh, for coastal bank for land subject to coastal storm flow and uh, no adverse impacts to salt marsh coastal dune or coastal beach. So no other comments. Okay. Dale, you have any questions? No. Okay. Tom, any questions? Questions. Thank you. about is backwashing filters and chlorine and et cetera. Uh, uh, my name is Mike McGrath, yes. The, uh, in Massachusetts, you have to have um, um, basically a recirculating system so and that keeps the water clean. And uh, there's, we, um, I'll clarify it, but there's a dry well that they're going to drain the pool into whenever it needs to be drained or when the, uh, oh, when there's an overflow. The, the dry well is, is, uh, just off the house, but now that I look at it, it's a little too close. If you look at the south corner of the house, and in between that and the point of the pool, there's a dry well, but I need to move that away from the house a little bit. Uh, and in any case, uh, we will provide the, um, the necessary um, components. There's also a fence that's uh, clearly um, uh, shown all the way around the pool to meet the requirements of the state uh, as far as uh, having a fence. Okay, good catch. Okay. Okay, uh, Chad, questions? No questions. No questions, and I will pass. Uh, given that, uh, any questions, any other questions from anybody in the audience not called upon? Kate, we have anybody calling in on this? Uh, no, no, no public comment on this. And just one additional comment from Board of Health uh, for the record. Property is not in a zone two. Plans have been submitted and reviewed by Board of Health. Um, rodent inspection and asbestos inspection required prior to delin demolition. Okay. In that case, I no question, no further questions. I guess we've called for the motion. Chad, do you have a motion for us? Motion to close an issue for 16 Pompanesque and Island Road. Second. Okay. All those in favor, Dale, we'll start with you. Aye. Tom. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Um, I'd like to see a certified plan for the relocation of that dry well, but I'm, I'm in favor of the project, but only until we have a certified copy of where that new dry well location is going to be. Um, could I speak? Please. I'll have it to you by Monday. Perfect. Okay, yeah, we'll just treat it as an oversight if we can just, do we have any issue if we move on and you'll take care of that administratively? Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll continue then with Paul's A vote. How about Chad? Aye. Okay, and I will vote aye as well. So the motion carries. Project will continue. Move Thank to you the very six. much. Thank you, Mike. Okay. The 609 hearing of Robert L. Lynch and Diane Brace at 3 Seconset Point Road. Proposed demolition reconstruction of a single family dwelling with an associated garage, access ramps, coastal walkover structures, patio, ridge station, septic system, <clears throat> landscaping, hardscaping, and mitigation planting. At the request of the applicant, it has been continued from 528. It's Matt Martin, and we'll talk to it from BSC Group. Yep, and Matt, I just invited you into the meeting. Uh, as soon as you pop up on the screen, you can just introduce yourself for the record. And we'll proceed from there.
Matt Creighton, are you there? Matt? Hey, Drew, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. I have a new guy on mute, and I'm trying to unmute the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, so, again, my name is Matt Creighton from BSC Group. I'm representing Diane and Bob, the, the property owners here, uh, for tonight's meeting. Uh, the proposed project is a raise and replace of a single-family house. Um, we have uh, the existing structure is between 14 feet um, or 14.1 feet and 18 and a half feet or so. so. So just under 20 feet along the top of the coastal bank of the site. And uh, what we're proposing to do with the new property is to rotate that structure uh, so that it is the, the northwest corner, I suppose, would be moving in landward. So it'll be about 40 feet off the top of the coastal bank, and we're going to kind of pivot on that southwestern corner. Um, so the, the closest point will be 20 feet, and then, and then further away up towards the north, it'll be, a, it'll be about 40 feet out. Um, the proposed project also includes a uh, coastal bank walkover structure. We have an existing jetty uh, that is on the, on the property, and we've located the walkover uh, just north of that jetty because that's where we've got a little sand beach that's kind of growing there. Uh, the walkover will be uh, about 20 feet long, four foot wide, um, just a typical walkover structure. The coastal bank is completely armored. Um, land subject closest to arm flowage does hit the bank, but it doesn't go over it. Uh, so it'll be um, a little impact on the beach on the bottom and no impact from an erosion standpoint to the bank because it's all armored. Uh, at the site, um, we are within 100 feet of the top of the coastal bank with the proposed house. Uh, we've got the coastal bank with the walkover structure intact, and then we've got a coastal beach and land under ocean, and, and obviously the Wilcoit Bay uh, ACEC, um, which we're not we're not impacting, but it is just off the coast there. Um, in the proposed project, we are removing three cedar trees within the zero to fifty foot buffer zone, and four within uh, the fifty to one hundred. Well, three cedars and one one dying oak. Uh, I'm sorry, one dying pine tree. Uh, we're proposing to replace those, uh, the three within the, the zero to 50 and the four within the 50 to 100 uh, around the project, around the property there. Um, as far as uh, mitigation for the project is concerned, we, we've proposed 1,240 square feet of mitigation, uh, all within the zero to 50 foot buffer zone, not including the, the tree replacements. Um, that's all in an area of existing lawn and kind of surrounds the, the outer edge of the property there. Um, we're also proposing dry wells for roof runoff. Uh, the septic system is being relocated out of the 100-foot buffer zone. Uh, right now it falls just inside the 100. And we have a shed that's in the 50-foot buffer zone that we're moving outside of the 100-foot buffer um, resource area to the uh, coastal bank. Uh, right now, we've got about 4,247 square feet of lawn that's existing. That'll be dropped down to 2,500 square feet of lawn with the proposed project uh, within the 0 to 50. And within the 50 to 100, we're going to go from 3,649 square feet of lawn down to 1,600 square feet. So overall, just a significant uh, reduction in lawn. And I think that's pretty much the gist of it. Drew, I'll let you go ahead and comment. Okay. Uh, so just to show some photos of the site uh, to everybody. <coughs> Top left is the uh, dirt driveway heading into the parcel uh, from Sakasa Point Road. Top right, just uh, looking at the septic uh, staking uh, and looking out at the house uh, closer to the coastal bank. Uh, here you can see bottom left, one of the uh, oak trees proposed to be removed, and I think that's in the septic footprint. Um, and again, bottom right, looking at uh, some of the cedar trees that are proposed to be removed uh, and replaced uh, as well. So again, uh, looking um, on the south side of the home, there's the shed proposed to be removed, a couple of cedar trees supposed to be removed. Uh, and I'll go back to the plan to show where cedar trees are proposed uh, to be replaced. Um, top right photo, looking at the home, um, I believe, uh, I don't think that cedar tree is proposed to be removed. I think that's one of the ones that's staying, but we'll go back to the plan and take a look at that. 
Uh, yeah, that's a keeper, Drew. That's a keeper? Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, showing the water side of the home here with the deck. Uh, again, see the trees over here. This one is marked for removal, I believe. You can see the band across it right there. And then looking down at the coastal bank, uh, the armored coastal bank, this is Wakoya Bay. Uh, again, an ACEC water body, but all the proposed work is contained outside of the ACEC, which is roughly, you know, in this area here, coincides with the... Uh, Mean low water, Matt, or mean high water? I think it's, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's mean low water based on mean low, low uh, tidal datum. Okay. But, yeah, mean low water, essentially, okay. regardless of the datum. Right. So I'm where I'm standing in this lower right photo, just in the foreground here, I apologize, I didn't get a picture of the immediate area, but that's where the stairway is going down to a small kind of coastal beach area that you see uh, in this photo. But it's in the foreground. It's really down here. Um, but that's the uh, general area where the uh, access stairway is going down the bank. And um, just a couple more perspective photos uh, of the site. Um, again, right where the lower uh, bottom left photo here, that stake right there, that's where the stairway is going down the bank. Again, just another shot of the front yard so you can see the existing conditions. You've got lawn going up to an armored coastal bank. And then uh, here, uh, looking out at some of the neighboring properties, uh, this is where some of the mitigation area and removal of turf is taking place again, all within 50 feet uh, of the resource area. So it's, it's definitely good to see removal of turf uh, and, and the mitigation areas. I'll go back to the plan. The mitigation areas are uh, proposed all along the top of the bank, uh, and then you've got some other areas where you've got uh, cedars um, proposed, uh, additional mitigation, mitigation fronting the deck, uh, replacement cedars here on the north side of the property, and then again more mitigation uh, where the uh, property line meets some of the budding properties over here. Um, so, you know, the reduction of turf, uh, the pulling back of the property from the coastal bank, um, all really, uh, given that ACEC is a, uh, uh, Bay is an ACEC water body, uh, primarily impacted by nitrogen loading. Uh, so it's good to get uh, projects that reduce the amount of turf. And I, and I would also say, uh, Matt didn't get into this, but it's likely to assume that this turf will all get disturbed. So if it's not the type and variety that's under our uh, nitrogen control bylaw or in our, under our grass uh, lawn standards regulation, and this area gets torn up, what has to come back has to meet those uh, standards. It looks like a rye fescue lawn right now, uh, but if it's not, uh, it will be uh, when it gets, when these lawn areas get restored, if you approve the project uh, and, you know, after construction activity, this, this grass area would be restored, uh, along with the addition of mitigation. So um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Board of Health comments. Um, Let's see, not, property is not in a zone two. Plans have been submitted to Board of Health uh, for review. A reserve area must be included on the plan. Asbestos inspection and road inspection must be conducted prior to demolition. So, no other comments. Yeah, Drew, Drew just to touch on that too, the reserve area, if you look on the very bottom of your plan, it's like way off the bottom there. Yeah, I didn't uh, uh, yeah. Even farther over. Yeah, so they, they did get the revised plan with the reserve oh, okay. Uh, okay. on it, just to, uh, just to touch on that one comment. But. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, Dale, you have any questions? Dale? Pat? Yeah. Um, on. No questions, thank you. Don? Uh, no comments or questions. Paul? I'll pass. Chad? No questions. I, I have a question really with regard to, I guess it would be jurisdiction. Uh, it says to come up very infrequently in my time uh, in the commission, and that is that they made reference where the uh, stairs are going to go uh, to the jetty to the I think it's to the south of where the stairs are and that the jetty had acc accumulated a bit of sand at that point and therefore that was a good spot to land the stairs I guess the question is 
that something under the jurisdiction of this commission to suggest that perhaps there's a reason why that should be retained and or uh, fixed a bit? Oh, oh the jetty? The jetty. Um, the jetty, yeah, it's, you know, it's, as you can see, it's accumulating a little sand there. It's doing its job. Right. Uh, and uh, I guess the question is, it's also pretty sad. It's been knocked over a few times. question is, do we make a suggestion? Is it within our jurisdiction? I'm trying to think of another situation. Well, I mean, I think it's a homeowner's call if they want to address that. Uh, and then, obviously, we would need the details to go along with that uh, in a revised plan. Um, but, it's, it, you know, it's their, it's their call. I would say, you know, it, they are getting kind of uh, starved of sand because that jetty um, is not as good a shape as the ones in the background that you can see there. So they're getting, they're not getting the lion's share of sand anymore uh, because of that jetty uh, degradation. But that's really their call. Um, and, and I actually, you know, now that you mentioned it, Brad, I, I did mention that to the homeowner when I was on site speaking to her while I was taking pictures, that it's something she might want to address at some point in the future so they can get some sort of a beach out here uh, similar to their neighbors. Yep, and, and perhaps to protect protect the revetment as and well, to, so it yeah, doesn't you know, cut yeah. it under. Exactly, yeah. Okay, do we have any questions from anybody listening in? Anybody call? Nope, nobody has called in from the public on this. Okay, hearing no more further questions, then I guess we will go and ask Chad for a motion. Motion to close an issue, three Seconta Point Road. <laughs> Second. Okay, we we will now go to the vote. Dale. Aye. Tom. Um, Aye. John. John. John is here. John, your vote. John has gone silent on us. <laughs> we'll move on. Paul. Yes. Okay, Paul. That is yes. Paul. Okay, we've got everybody now. Chad. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion has carried. Thank you very much. We'll move on to six twelve. Six twelve is Michael P. and Candace L. Current of Twenty-eight Flatmont Circle. The proposed tree removal to allow for installation of fencing. Retaining walls and hard taping. This has been continued three times, and the representative continues to be Tom Bunker from BSS Design. <laughs> I'm getting Tom uh, invited into the meeting right now as we speak. He should be coming on shortly. Hey, uh, uh, let me see. Start the video. There he is. <laughs> oh, here I am. Yeah, here I am. All right. Yeah, thank you. Let me see if I can share the screen, too. Um, well, I've got your, I got the stuff up on the screen, Tom, uh, if you want to just cue me. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Tom. All right, yeah. <clears throat> so for the, yes, for the record, my name is Tom Bunker, and this is the uh, third or so time I've, well, no, second time I've actually been here, but we've uh, continued a couple of times uh, in talking with Drew and changing the plan. Um, and uh, I hope this one will uh, work properly. See the the uh, green circled lot here on uh, the 28 flat pond circle. Uh, there's, this is on the private uh, New Seabury uh, sewer system. It's uh, inland from the golf course, and I'll say right now that I've heard the other hearings, uh, at least two of the other hearings, had uh, mentioned that they're in the ACEC. And this whole area of the golf course and up to uh, near the lot is in the flood zone, therefore being in in the ACEC also. Um, and so on, on this site, you can see that uh, there are two areas that are uh, noted as uh, uh, coastal bank areas at the sort of the top right and bottom right on this uh, drawing. Here, there's the little hatched areas labeled Coastal Bank. The heavy dash lines is, is the uh, flood zone, 
that's actually a velocity zone coming up to this far on the site. Uh, it doesn't quite meet, meet the lot, but then between the, uh, that one heavy line and there's a, another heavy dash line uh, up closer to the work area, which is a shaded X flood zone. And then inland from that, uh, basically all the rest of the lot is in zone, zone X. The house, garage, and existing swimming pool. Peter, this is the uh, wrong plan you have up here. Oh, it's not the right plan? No. Uh, sorry, hold on one second. Let me... Uh... Can I put mine on? Yeah, go ahead and put yours on. I'll stop share, Tom. Whenever you're ready, you can start sharing. Try this here. Can you see my plan? Yep. All right. So I just added a little bit of color to this. But, uh, see, the, the red lines uh, here are the... Um, That the this coast bank in this location and down at the bottom right is an area of coastal bank and uh, there's the velocity zone here the area part of the area that's between this uh, heavier line and this line is uh, the flood zone shaded X which is not a hazard zone and then the, the end of the flood zone is this dashed line that runs through, which changes from shaded X to uh, flood zone X, which is not a flood zone, basically. Um, so the existing swimming pool, existing patio come to here. The pool was somewhat built on fill, as you can see the contours. Down here is a fill, uh, at least on this upper side, encroached into the 50 foot buffer, but there is no structure on it. It's not located on here, but there's native uh, pitch pine seedlings all growing on this bank at the moment outside of the fence. So the existing pool fence runs along this line and just skirts the 50 foot buffer, and it runs along parallel to the back side of the pool and then back up toward the house. Um, and so what, uh, basically, what the Kearns want to do is, because of this pool, this rather fence, the, the pool fence uh, is in the way of their view, so what they're trying to do is get, uh, extend this area and actually uh, get it down to a lower elevation, so at the top of the fence, uh, will be lower so that from their patio or the porch area they can look over the top of the fence out toward the golf course in this area. So what we have this heavy black line right here is the proposed uh, block retaining wall when they stack together with, with pins does not require a concrete footing or anything like that. Uh, it will start at the existing ground elevation, basically elevation 23 up here, and will step down the low part of the wall, be down at elevation 20 in this corner, and then uh, come back up again uh, slowly to elevation 22 at this corner, where it will sort of blend with, in with the neighbor's retaining wall in this location, and then just return back up to where the existing fence is now. So the fence will come down from where it is now and follow the wall uh, uh, down to a lower elevation and then back up again to uh, help achieve their desired result of then being able to see over the fence uh, out toward the, uh, as I said, out toward the, uh, the golf course fairway. And I don't know if, I don't think they have a view of any, uh, Nantucket Sound, but they'll get some view of uh, the golf course anyway. And so then this area here, which uh, now uh, is a very steep slope of going down to elevation 50, uh, down to elevation 50, then there will have less of a slope, um, basically down to elevation 20. So there's basically a low corner here, there'd be five feet of fill retained 
by this wall. There is one 18 inch opening right here, uh, which we have uh, shown to be removed. Uh, there is some planting that was required uh, from 2007 when this pool was built. I think there was an, uh, a notice in order of conditions that allowed some uh, removal of invasive plants through this area and replanted with, uh, and there was a plant list provided in 2007, which was never done. And so now we show these plants, which includes uh, the six uh, Shadlow, Amelanchier canadensis through here, uh, 16 Inkberry, Holly spread through here, and there were uh, 15 sweet pepper, Clectra ulnifolia, and we have added a couple of black chokeberry here, uh, somewhat to give a little bit of mitigation for removing this, this oak tree. There are other oak trees along the way that will will fill in over time. Um, but this is just staying outside of the 50-foot buffer. There will be some temporary disturbance uh, for the workers to get through. As I said, it's, it's a type of wall that comes with the small blocks that are hand stacked. Um, and uh, so you know, all of that can be done by hand, no concrete uh, uh, trucks or anything involved there, form work. It's a shallow trench. They just need a compacted gravel footing in here to, uh, to place start building the wall from there and uh, filling it and uh, low and seed with the uh, proper uh, drought tolerant dry and fescue mix uh, in, in this location right here. That is our proposal and I'll uh, take any questions. Do you want me to stop sharing now? Uh, before you stop sharing, if the commission has any questions on your plan. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's ask the commissioners. Uh, Drew, do you have any following up questions? Well, I, I wanted to hold off on my comments Comment. until because he's sharing his plan. I don't have the proper plan in my presentation. So, if anyone has any questions at this point about anything he's gone over, and if not, then we can have him stop sharing, and I'll put up my photos. Okay, and let's uh, let's check. Anybody have any questions in regards to the uh, plan? that Tom has put in front of us. Okay. We'll go around the hoop. Dale? Tom? Um, pass. No. John? No questions. Paul? I'll pass. Chad? No questions. And I will pass as well. So let's go to the pictures that you have through for us to take a look at. Uh, so, Tom, you want to stop sharing and then I'll... Uh... Yeah, I stopped. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, back to you, Drew. Yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay. So, looking at the... Um... I'll move this over a little bit. Okay. Top left photo is a uh, shot of the house from, the, from Flat Pond Circle. Uh, the existing pool We're not patio. seeing that. We're not seeing that, Drew. Oh, you're not seeing it? Okay, hold on one no. second. Okay. Let's hear it. just got the, uh, the stag line over here. Okay. Why is this? Uh, I'm trying to get it back up to uh, a share screen. Bear with me a moment. Bottom right where? No, in the picture itself, when you come over, it's in the next Oh, okay, there we go. Where is the sharing? Can you 
come up here and show me. Thank you. Everybody see that now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Top left uh, shot of the house from the flat pond circle. Uh, top right is the existing pool patio area with the fence Tom was referring to as they were having issues uh, with the view and the fence prohibiting the view out uh, towards the golf course. Bottom left again just another view of the pool patio and the fence location and this is where the bulk of the work is proposed over by the fence. Bottom right, this is the uh, condition out uh, beyond the, the uh, pool patio area, looking out towards the golf course and then Vineyard Sound in the distance. This is the area here they received, or the previous homeowner received a permit for vista pruning uh, onto this uh, property off, off, the, off their property. They got the Seabury property permission and they did the vista pruning and in this area here was where there was a lot of invasive uh, material vegetation that was taken out but as Tom had described there was a whole list of native species that was supposed to be planted that he went over on his plan that never got put in and this is the barren area today where those species were to have been put in. Uh, again just a couple more shots uh, here this kind of shows you the scope of the area where that grading is going to take place. Um, I'm not sure if that's the 18 inch oak Tom was referring to, but it's one of these trees that is going to be impacted from the proposed work. Again, it is outside the 50 foot buffer to the coastal bank. Uh, and then again, just a shot looking at uh, the trees uh, and the buffer zone out from the top of that uh, slope. So this will be the area where most of the mitigation is coming in. Uh, and up here, coming out from the fence, that's where that grading is going to take place to kind of lessen the grade here uh, and get a little bit of expansion out uh, for that pool patio area and lower the grade to lower the fence. Um, so because it's outside the 50-foot buffer to the coastal bank is why we had uh, recommended a request for determination of applicability for this application instead of a notice of intent. And just a word on the coastal bank itself, it is a landform coastal bank. Again, it's not, uh, its performance standards are limited to a vertical buffer to storm damage. It is not a sediment source bank um, that nourishes down drift uh, coastal resource areas. So uh, performance standard wise, there is no impact to the coastal bank or to, there's also a freshwater wetland that's back here. Um, that you can't see in any of the photos because it's outside of the uh, the 100 foot setback from the proposed work. It's roughly in this area here and then you've got flat pond in the distance. So all of this work is contained within uh, this kind of scope area here along the fence uh, with the exception of one tree being proposed to be removed and then mitigating for that with some native shrubs. Putting in the native shrubs that should have gone in back in 2000, uh, 2009 I believe. So overall, um, it meets the performance standards. There's no impact to ACEC. And um, we're getting mitigation that uh, has been not been put in place that, uh, that really should have been placed, uh, implemented a long time ago. So it's good to see that this plan shows that and that will be happening, um, even though it's kind of aside from the initial project scope. Um, no other comments. Okay. Uh Dale, you have any questions? Dale? Oh, sorry. Uh, pass. Okay, Tom. No question. Thank you. John Schwartzbach. No questions. Paul Colombo. No questions. Chad Smith. No questions. I have no questions either. Uh, so given that, is there anybody uh, listening or attending someplace that has any questions? There are no public comments for this application. Okay, so therefore I'll entertain a motion, Chad. Motion for negative determination for flat pond circle. Second. Second, okay. All those in favor, starting with Dale. Aye. 
Tom O'Neill. Aye. Don Schwarzbach. Aye. Paul Colombo. Yes. Chad Smith. Aye. And I will vote yes as well. So the motion has carried. Project can continue. We'll uh, move to 615. Thank you. Thank you. Don B. and Catherine M. Burke at 23 Montemoscoy Road West for proposed bank stabilization. This is an NOI. It also includes landscaping construction of an elevated platform and stairs. And Matt Costa is still waiting to present this. Thank you, Mr. Matt. Chairman. For the record, Matt Costa, Cape and Islands Engineering, representing the applicant. As you stated, we're here tonight under a notice of intent application uh, to uh, perform some shoreline stabilization work through what you would call a soft solution and to construct uh, at some future time a 4x4 four four platform with stairs uh, and a path leading to that platform. Uh, Drew has the property pulled up on the screen here. This is uh, addressed as 23 Montemascoy Road West. It is uh, one of the, it's a paper road. Uh, as you can see, it's at the uh, end uh, of uh, Child's Road. Child's Road, yeah. Okay, Child's and Road, okay. It, yeah, it's it's a, a little lot, about 9,000 square feet, um, located uh, right on the waters of Hamlin Pond, as you see there. Uh, the, the resource areas for this project include land under the ocean, land containing shellfish, um, salt marsh, coastal beach, uh, coastal bank, of land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, also, this pro this a portion of not a portion of the project, but uh, Hamlin Pond is an ACEC, uh, and that boundary is defined by the mean low water. Uh, there's no work being proposed in the ACEC. Um, Drew has the plan pulled up here. Um, this is a, a situation where we have uh, a small coastal bank, but what's happening is the bank's being uh, eroded. Uh, it's Get, the vegetation is getting undercut, uh, and then we have some trees along the shoreline that are tipping over and further destabilizing the bank, uh, creating this, this negative cycle. Uh, what we're going to do, what we're proposing to do is to first stabilize that area with some uh, uh, core logs that will be anchored in place uh, to provide uh, them, put some suitable material uh, behind those uh, logs, uh, a sandy loam mix that would be suitable for establishing some deep-rooted native grasses uh, and intermingling those along with the existing vegetation. Uh, the purpose is to first come in and stabilize the area. We're going to do that by uh, cutting a few of the tree trunks down. Um, I don't know, maybe some pictures would be helpful here, Drew, if you got a yeah. picture. That shoreline, we have some trees that are tipping over, so we're going to uh, remove a couple of those trees that are leaning over, but we're going to leave the root system in place. You can see in that lower right-hand photo, uh, or there's, a, there's a good one right there. Uh, there's a group of photos. In the, in the lower left photo, uh, you can see one tree that's already come all the way down, landed on the marsh. Um, so we want to stop that from happening. So we're going to cut a couple of those trunks back. It's going to leave the root systems there. We're essentially going to stuff the logs into the eroded areas uh, to temporarily stop that sediment washing into the salt marsh um, and then plant behind it with, uh, as I stated, some deep-rooted native grasses. And the root systems uh, will help lock that bank into place and overtake the uh, core logs over time. Um, and our hope is, and what we've seen on similar projects, is that once you stop that uh, continuous source of sediment from um, infiltrating the salt marsh area, that, that, that the salt marsh vegetation is going to take off. Uh, and that, that salt marsh vegetation, once it gets established, is going to be one of our primary lines of defense for erosion. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell on the portion of the shoreline stabilization. 
Uh, those stairs right there that Drew has in the picture on the lower left, those are showing the plan. Those are actually in, uh, in Child's Road, and they're they're beyond the center line. Child's Road is private. They're beyond the center line of the road, so we're not proposing to do anything with those stairs because they're off of what our property rights would be to do work. Uh, we're going to bring up uh, the stabilization just to the left side of those stairs, right in there, where he's got he's got the cursor. Um, so uh, another component of this project is the four by four platform, uh, similar to what you saw in 31 wheelhouse recently, uh, and that is the same situation. Uh, and this is one of the projects that we did discuss with Drew, and this is we're expecting to carry the same special condition. Uh, about that not being constructed until such time a harbor master uh, grants an appropriate permit for a 10 a float and ramp. Um, we believe the project as it is designed meets all the applicable performance standards under your regulation, uh, which we've articulated in our narrative and we're respectfully requesting you to consider conditions of happy answer questions. Okay, Drew, do you have the additional information for us? Um, other than just to kind of go review the pictures, which you can see is really evident along this particular shoreline, um, and, and it's happening a lot, you know, in various areas around town, uh, especially Monomaskoy, where you see this undercutting. The photos really don't do it justice, but this top right probably shows it best, where you got the upland shelf that's just getting undermined, and then the trees just get their roots exposed, and they continue to fall out. Uh, and as long as they're attached to the bank, those root systems come out even more, which exacerbates the erosion even more. Um, you know, and it comes from boat wakes, it comes from wind, uh, the wave energy back here. It's not a large fetch, but when you get the boat wakes, you get the ice rafting, you get the winds, and it just slowly starts to erode and undercut this whole uh, stretch of coastline. So um, it's good to see the property owner doing something proactive about that and dealing with this erosion. Um, and then, as, as uh, Matt had said and we described earlier in the 31 Wheelhouse project, um, this platform uh, will be contingent upon uh, the Harbor Management Plan, the Harbor Master, uh, and everything that was described uh, previously in, the, in that uh, prior application with similar uh, type of um, platform. So overall, uh, this is, this is a, a net environmental benefit. Uh, that's being proposed as far as the coastal bank aspect of this. And um, then you've got the platform that could be conditioned to not be constructed until such time as uh, all the parties are, you know, on board, um, as was described previously. So no other uh, comments. Okay. Any comments from Dale? Dale, we can't hear you. Okay. Dale passed. Okay, uh, Tom O'Neill. No comments, thank you. John Schwarzbach. No comments. Paul Colombo. No questions. Chad Smith. No questions. And I have no questions. Uh, so therefore, do I hear a motion on this project? Yeah, a motion um, to close an issue. Uh, 23 Mono Square Road. Second. Here a second. Okay. We'll call the vote. Dale McKay. Aye. Tom O'Neill. Aye. Don Swashbuck. Aye. Paul Colombo. Yes. Chad Smith. Aye. And I will vote yes as well. So the motion has carried. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Matt. Hey, Drew, could you, could you uh, tell us who's next up? I hit a bad button here, and I don't have an agenda in front of me. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so the next one up is 126 Waiting Place Road, uh, Stephen F. and Donna M. McDonald, and they have requested that this hearing be continued to July 9th at 6 p.m. July 9th, okay. Do I hear a motion to support the uh, the applicant's request? Ed? 
Chad? Still move. So I hear a second. Uh, someone will have to make a second. Chad lost second. audio. Second. Okay. okay. All those in favor, starting with Gail. Aye. Um. Aye. Don. Aye. Paul. Oh. Yes. Chad. He can't hear you. <laughs> okay, and I will vote yes. So the motion has carried. Okay. Okay. So they took care of that. Now let's see. Can you continue, Drew? I'm still trying to dig out yeah. my agenda. So the, the next hearing up uh, is David G. Peck, 1 Chestnut Street, uh, proposed amendment of the order of conditions for 43-3038 to install an access stairs over Coastal Bank. Representative is Mike Borselli from Falmouth Engineering, whom I will invite into the meeting. Right. Hey, Drew. Hey, Mike. I'm inviting you now. All right. I stay on the phone and speak, correct? I don't go through the other. Nope. Stay on the phone and speak. That's correct. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Brad, do you want to call that meeting to order as I had stated? Or call that hearing uh, to order? Okay, sorry. I'm trying to do three things at the same time. So we now have the motion in front of us, and uh, we will see whether... Okay, so at this point you have told us that we'll, we will now address the, uh, the project that Drew has just described. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, and, Mike. Uh, We're ready, Mike. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Michael Borselli from Falmouth Engineering, and I represent the applicant, David Peck. Uh, you may recall this property. You reviewed and approved the permit to do some vista pruning. Um, during that process, um, um, we had some discussions with staff about the possibilities of gaining access through uh, timber stairs from the upland uh, top of the bank down to the um, uh, shoe spot. String Bay uh, water body for the purposes of uh, recreational uses. Um, so we've requested an amendment to the original order of conditions <clears throat> to allow for the placement of a 4x4 um, post supported timber stairway um, as shown on the plan. There's a um, plan view location of a four foot wide uh, stairway. There's a profile that shows how the stairway will lead from the upland and traverse the bank through a, uh, a, a set of stairs and a mid-landing and then additional stairs. <clears throat> um, the wetland resources in question include the coastal bank, and as I work my way seaward, there's land subject to coastal storm flowage in the form of uh, flood zone AE12. Um, Further seaward is a salt marsh, and then you have uh, shoestring bay, which would be land under a water body. The stairway is designed to um, fit in between existing trees, um, and it, it lands um, not in the salt marsh, just upland of the salt marsh between the toe of the coastal bank and the salt marsh. Um, the work is all works proposed to be done by hand. Uh, four by four posts, uh, timber stringers, and, and timber um, decking uh, are pro uh, proposed. Um, uh, I'm going to make one correction to what I just said. We were proposing to use six by six posts, not four by four posts. Uh, they they will still be, of course, hand hand installed as shown on the detail. Um, there will be a little bit of vegetation clearing just at the top of the bank to allow for a path to lead to the up, the upper landing from the lawn area. Um, I, I think that sums it up, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Drew, do you have anything to add? Uh, just some photos. Um, the top left here is taken uh, looking at the backyard leading to the coastal bank over here. Those two stakes, which you can kind of make out there, that's the delineated top of the stairway that's going down a 
pretty thickly vegetated bank, so there's no way to photos to really show you what the bank looks like other than just total greenery. Um, you know, this area on the top right kind of shows you, gives you a, an idea of what the vegetation looks like going down the bank here. Uh, again, just another look um, at the top of the coastal bank. Uh, I think that's all the photos I have. The, the one question, um, we had another shot going down the bank, but you really couldn't tell the slope. Uh, but um, this top right photo here kind of gives you an idea of the vegetation that uh, uh, makes up the bank going down towards the salt marsh and shoestring bay. Uh, Mike, the question that I had, and I, I don't know if you have the answer to this or not, and it's really just based on the plan that shows a stairway terminating to nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just there's no platform, there's no dock. Uh, is there any indication from the homeowner as far as what the plans are beyond this? Uh, is he planning on – I mean, I don't think we're going to see a situation where, you know, we're going to see hordes of people just trampling over salt marsh at the end of the stairway. But at the same time, I think the commission, and I know myself, would be curious what's happening from here on out. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, the applicant has told me that um, this is for passive uh, recreational uses, um, such as kayaking, um, try, um, you know, walking along the shoreline and wading into the water just for um, passive recreational uses. There's no plan to expand this to any sort of elevated walkway or pier. There's actually a, a stand of Phragmites in this salt marsh, unfortunately. So you have to kind of literally pick your path of least resistance when you uh, try to make your way to the actual water's edge for a kayak. But that's the type of uses that we're talking about. Okay, well, has he given any thought? So I, I guess based on that description, he's proposing to carve a path through the salt marsh to get to the water at the end of this stairway. I mean, did he consider a raised walkway to protect the salt marsh from a footpath right across the top of it? Cause he no, had... um, but well, not at this time he didn't. Um, we've, um, we, we talked about random crossing of the salt marsh, not creating a path, you know, entering in different locations. If you walk along the toe of the bank, there are some open areas between the toe of the bank and the salt marsh. So had no plans. I don't think he wants to go through the expensive or the permitting effort to try to um, get a, an elevated walkway permitted. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. It's it's just kind of and not that, I, you know, not that I would think it's going to experience a lot of foot traffic as you described. It's just that, you know, when, when we see uh, access pathways for the purpose of, like you described, getting a canoe and kayak to the water, recreational access, um, it does raise a bit of a red flag that, you know, we're going to be subjecting this area to, you know, um, an access that's a stairway and then an access that's a footpath uh, over salt marsh, which is a very, you know, fragile it doesn't take a lot of foot traffic over salt marsh to start making uh, some, you know, impact. Um, you know, every once in a while, and there's no way to really gauge it uh, with this particular application. Um, so that's kind of what makes me a little apprehensive about uh, this situation. It, it, again, I'll preface it by saying, I, I, you know, I don't know how much foot traffic is going across. I, I certainly can understand, you know, the financial end of it. But at the sure. same time, you're talking about a resource area that only doesn't really take much foot traffic to start making an impact. So I don't know if he's thought about that, um, or maybe there's a way that he can kind of, you know, flag out uh, for people to follow over the salt marsh so people aren't spraying, you know, going all over the place with foot traffic to get to the water. Uh, and, and we also don't want this to lead to a situation where he's storing his canoes and kayaks on the salt marsh or near the salt marsh at the end of this ladder, or right. at the end of the stairway, rather. So, you know, those are just some concerns that I have uh, based on what's presented. I, I get everything you're saying. I understand it. I'm just relaying to you what, what my concerns are. Sure, I can just, um, let me just say, say this. It's, it's light access by family members only seasonal only, you know, they, this is a summer home for them, and um, 
he's already been instructed about storage of the kayaks, and I, we would certainly expect there to be a condition that, you know, kayaks must be stored in the upland. Okay. Um, so um, that, that's pretty much all I can uh, say about it. Um, he's, this, pro this property's been in his family for decades, and they're very sensitive to, um, you know, the salt marsh. In fact, one of the reasons they proposed the stairway is because they're also sensitive to the potential uh, erosion of the coastal bank. It's a pretty steep bank, and they really have a difficult time traversing from the upland down the bank now to make use of the waterfront. That I agree. It's a very steep coastal bank. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I don't have any other comments. Okay. Hey, anybody have any questions? Uh, starting with Dale. No. Pat. Um. No comment. Thank you. John? Swartz. No questions. Paul Colombo? Uh, no questions, but I would like to see a special condition for no storage of the kayaks in the salt marsh area. We can make sure we can put that in. Yeah. Chad? No questions. Uh, I have the same point that Drew was making. Uh, I've seen a number of times in various bays around here where kayaks are stored, not upland. Uh, they may have been directed to, but it's easier when you've got a, uh, you know, somewhere around 15, 16 feet up those stairs with a kayak, though they make kayaks lighter and lighter every year. They get laid right against that coastal bank, and then you're starting to impact the vegetation. So that has got to be emphasized in the order of conditions. For yes, and if I could, Mr. Chairman, one other comment about that. We, uh, we, I, I spoke with the applicant about the possibility of re retrofitting the uh, posts with uh, brackets on the outside edge that w could be s installed in a way that the kayaks can be hung from the uh, sides of the uh, stairway as well. Good. That, that makes sense. Keep it, keep it up a bit and keep it from damaging the grass. That's, that's a good answer. Okay, uh, any other questions? Hearing none, anybody in the audience? Drew, anybody? Uh, we have nobody calling in on this application. Okay, so Chad, do you have a motion? Yeah, this is, um, forgive me, this is an uh, amended order of conditions? It is an amended order of conditions, correct. It is. Yeah. I have a motion that we issue the amended order of conditions for Chestnut Street. With, with some conditions? Uh, yes, of course. With the aforementioned conditions with regards to the um, salt marsh and the kayaks. Storage of kayaks. Okay, do I hear a second deal? Second. Second. Okay, we'll count off the votes. Dale. Uh, nay. On. Aye. Bond. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yes. Chad. Aye. I vote aye with the conditions. Okay, so that we now have an approved amended open order of conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Moving, moving to the 624 application of Philip A. and Denise M. George. 25 Nosh on Road, proposed renovations to dwelling, septic system upgrades, swimming pool, spa, hardscaping, landscaping modifications. Mike oh, Purcelli yeah. is up again <laughs> with this. I think I, I, I think I mistakenly and, removed him. It was removed. I thought it was and, something I said. <laughs> and Sorry, and Mike. Can you, uh, can you rejoin? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll be <laughs> recusing myself on this. Okay. Scratch Tom. Uh, Mike, can you click on the link again? I apologize for that. Oh, yes. Just one moment, everybody. We'll get Mike back into the meeting. <laughs> Oops.
We'll bear with you. It was my fault. And it wasn't anything you said, Mike. <laughs> I'm just going back to the, uh, the link that okay. I received from Cynthia. Okay. No. Um, shoot. Well, I guess we could just do it uh, verbally, Mike. Um, and I'll, I'm fine with that because I have the yeah. drawing in front of me. Okay. Um, and you have it. And I have it uh, up on the screen right now. So. <coughs> so I think we can proceed. Uh, when Let, let's, why don't you describe what you need to do? You can see the street number 25 at the end of Narshan Road, overlooking Dean's Pond. Mr. Chairman, I'll, 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 I can present it. Um, so I represent the applicants. Uh, I submitted with the application um, a plan of existing conditions as well as a proposed plan. Um, so I'm making, uh, making reference to the plan of existing conditions. <clears throat> this property has an existing uh, four-bedroom single-family dwelling with a wraparound deck, uh, access stairs, lawn areas, um, a driveway uh, on the Narshan Road frontage. The, the uh, wetland resources of note uh, include Dean's Pond, which is a freshwater body, and then a sloping landform that is also uh, land subject to coastal storm flowage, so it's therefore a coastal bank. If you're familiar with this area, the Pompanesset uh, homeless Association has property between this parcel and Dean's Pond. Um, so built upon the coastal bank is a stone dust uh, pedestrian access way that uh, provides access for the neighborhood. Um, the coastal bank continues upslope from there to um, a landscape retaining wall which is shown. And the coastal bank actually follows along the uh, man-made retaining wall. The property's been uh, in existence since the early 80s. Uh, the uh, original septic system is on the plans. It is a substandard septic system. By that, I mean it doesn't meet today's Title V standards. The leaching pit for the septic system is in close proximity to the top of the bank, and it's it's only 40 feet from the waters of Dean's Pond. The existing house has four bedrooms. The proposed house will have four bedrooms. Uh, we do need to go to the Board of Health for certain setback variances, and the reason we need those setback variances is because we, if you um, can make uh, reference now to the proposed plan, we're proposing an upgrade to the septic system to shift the leaching system as far as physically possible from the waters of Dean's Pond to the opposite side of the house. Uh, so the new leaching system will now be just over 100 feet or 104 feet from Dean's Pond. Um, there's a new 1,500-gallon septic tank also proposed. The current tank is substandard size at 1,000 square feet. And that, too, is being shifted away from Dean's Pond. Um, the, the house is actually proposed to be uh, renovated in a very small addition proposed to it, but the other component of the application is a removal of the existing wraparound deck and replacement with a a lap pool and a, a small spa and a surround patio. All of these uh, elements are in an area that is either currently the deck or um, lawn area. The width of the house from front to back is being increased by two feet just so that the interior renovation room layout can be uh, easier to uh, manage and provide better uh, room depths from front to back. 
but that small two-foot extension is in an area that's already structured, and that is the wraparound deck. The, um, the current uh, deck is currently located 11 feet from the top of the bank at its closest point, uh, and it's on the north side, and it's 20 feet from the top of the bank on the south side. Um, there's a slight um, increase in surface area at grade that will be patio that is in a lawn area, um, but it is designed in a way that it doesn't move any closer to the top of the bank than the closest point of the existing um, structure. There's a proposal to um, modify the driveway to provide a visitor parking place between the house and Noshon Road. Um, this area is in um, um, an area that is currently yard area. There are three uh, oak trees between the house and Noshon Road that we're proposing to remove. But we're proposing to mitigate for their removal by placement of three new eastern red cedars in the southeast um, corner, I should say the far easterly corner of the lot adjacent to the path, uh, stone dust path on the Pompanesset uh, Association property. We went through the uh, mitigation calculations. We we provided the tabulation on the plan uh, in accordance with the buffer regulations, and we broke down the areas of mitigation. Um, the plan, the proposed plan, shows areas highlighted in a light green color. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to um, the corner closest to Noshon Road. Um, the northeast corner of the lot. That area um, is currently a gravel parking area um, between the retaining wall and Noshon. It's all gravel. In fact, some of the gravel area is actually on the land of Pompanesset Association. We're proposing to remove all of that gravel area except for a, a path um, and plant that area with um, native plantings. Uh, there's a crosshatched area on the plan between the wall and the property line to the east or towards the Dean's Pond side. That crosshatched area is all currently ornamental plants, no native plant material. We're proposing to remove and replace that with uh, native plant material. And then there are two other green shaded areas on the lawn areas that are currently lawn areas on the top side of the wall that we're proposing to remove the lawn and plant additional uh, native plantings. Uh, we talked to uh, Drew about appropriate plant material and um, we're proposing uh, bayberry and beech plum to be planted in these areas if appropriate for this setting. Um, the calculations indicates a requirement uh, based on increases of impervious or hardscapes uh, of 1,920 square feet. Our plan currently shows 1,600 square feet. We're, we're just shy of the, uh, map of the amount that the tabulation would require. And we're hopeful that you can allow us to propose that area and still allow the applicant to have some very small lawn areas surrounding the house. We, we believe that the overall improvements to the project with the mitigation planting that we're proposing, the removal of the gravel, the upgrade of the septic system to meet the setbacks to the wetland resources, um, make it that the overall project is a significant environmental improvement over what um, currently exists. Uh, when I was listening to an earlier application, I noted the comment about the drywall for the pool. Uh, I have not 
shown a dry well for the pool. We had, we had not discussed the type of uh, treatment that the pool water would have, but I can certainly provide a revised plan with the dry well. Um, the dry well would be for dry down for maintenance of the pool if necessary. And there's ample room to propose a dry well on the property. I, I think that sums up my presentation. We're scheduled to go to the Board of Health on June 18th for the requested setback variances that will allow us to provide a 100-foot separation from Dean's Pond with the new leaching system. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Drew, your comments? Okay, so uh, Mike, I'm just going to go through some photos of the site, and I've, I've followed along with what you were saying with some photos as well with the gravel area and other areas you've described and shown the, the existing and proposed uh, conditions plans as well, just so you're aware um, how we've been following along with your narrative. Um, so looking at the photos of the site, this is the gravel area Mike was describing uh, two gravel areas, one here to be, the, both of them to be planted with uh, native species. Um, this is the bank on the top right. Um, it's, uh, it's a combination of ornamental planting, some native species, mostly ornamental uh, in this area back here. This is the pathway that he was describing that belongs to the Pompanesset Beach Association that cuts through. And to the left of this pathway is Dean's Pond. Um, there's a shot bottom left photo here showing the existing deck and the staking for the uh, proposed bump out for the pool patio uh, extension. Uh, again, this light post kind of indicating near the top of the bank that you see on the top right photo here. Again, just another shot of the uh, existing deck with the staking shown. Uh, top left photo here is where the septic work is all concentrated into. Um, and then top right shows the existing driveway and some of the lawn in the backyard area. Here, uh, bottom left is where the trees that uh, Mike had spoke to about the driveway, guest driveway expansion uh, in this area. So you've got a couple of trees here. You've got the lamppost and then some hardscaping uh, leading up to the steps leading up to the deck. And then bottom right again, that gravel area that's proposed to be um, removed of the gravel and then planted with native species. Uh, and just on in the foreground here is the pathway, and then beyond that is Dean's Pond. So um, overall, uh, given the septic upgrade, given the uh, mitigation plantings that are proposed, as Mike had described, and you can see highlighted in green, a uh, relatively minor uh, expansion towards the resource area, but still staying outside of 50 feet from Dean's Pond in an EBBW. Uh, it meets the performance standards under the bylaw uh, and under the State Act as well. Um, and I think the upgrade in the septic, given the uh, existing location, uh, is a big, big upgrade part of this uh, project. So um, Board of Health comments, just very briefly. Zone 2 property is in a Zone 2 water recharge area. Variance request was submitted and will be reviewed by the Board of Health on June 18th of this year. No other comments. Okay. Commissioners, Dale, you have any questions? Uh, uh, John, do you have any questions? No questions. Paul. Um, I'd like to see the revised engineering plan for the location of the dry well to maintain the pool. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm happy to do that, but as we've been sp speaking, I, I'm going to speak to the health department, but I think it might, it might be appropriate to use the old um, cesspool for this only for the dry well in the event you need to draw down the pool. If not, I'll propose a new dry well, but um, either way, you know, we can submit a revised plan. Okay. Okay, so, okay this is, so we can condition this project anyway, so yes. let's make sure we have it, we have a condition, Drew. I've made note of it. Okay, Chad? 
Chad? Oh, Chad doesn't have audio, uh, unfortunately. Okay. He's well, working on it. <laughs> he, he loses, I guess. Huh? Uh, I only have... Oh, he's, he's back. Okay, so I don't have any questions. Let's return to Dale. Uh, or Chad for a motion. Can we somebody cover for that? The Chad? No. So moved, Dale. Okay. Somebody else give me a second. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor, Dale, can you vote please? Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yes. Chad. Oh. Well, we don't know. So I, I will vote yes. So it has carried. Motion has carried. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we're going to move on as quickly as we can to uh, you, another Mike. interesting project. 627 uh, hearing. It's Richard J. Cook and Diane Cook at 19 Pem Way for proposed demolition, reconstruction of a cottage, and hardscape modifications. Daniel Ahea. Down Cape Engineering will speak to the project. Yep, and Dan, yes. I've, just, uh, I've just invited you invited you to the meeting, Dan. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Yep. Uh, I see it up on the screen there. Uh, good evening, Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Dan Ojala. I'm a land surveyor and civil engineer with Down Cape Engineering in Yarmouthport. And um, helping uh, the cooks out with a pretty straightforward little project here. Uh, this is down on the Mashpee River, uh, Penn, uh, Pema Lane. And um, all they're doing is they've got an existing little cottage. Um, there was a, there's a kind of a big patio area. I guess it was formerly a pool. It's now just some hardscape in the middle of the site. Uh, but uh, what we're doing is um, the, the cottage is not in great shape. And so what we're going to do is, is uh, remove it and replace it. And we're going to pull it back a little bit further from the river. Um, and then the net hardscape is going to go down about 72 square feet. So it should be... Um, and your regulations fairly easy to uh, approve and that um, when you look at the distances to the coastal bank which is the, the nearest resource area we're getting a little bit further away from 23.2 to 25.6 feet and um, we are um, a little bit further from the wetland um, this coastal bank by the way um, uh, is um, not a sediment source so it's uh, it's a still water flooding area uh, only and uh, the bank will continue to perform you know if we ever do get the hundred year event it'll hold it back uh, the same whether we do this project or not it'll be a um, uh, somewhat uh, um, toward on the river side where the flooding occurs so um, we're going to take the right now there's no stormwater controls we're going to do um, gutters and downspouts to a little dry well on the back that'll be an improvement and um, we're infilling where the existing footprint is where we're pulling it back. We're putting uh, just a very thin four-foot uh, brick patio there with a little retaining wall. There's a slight grade condition. It falls off a little bit on the northeast corner. So we'll just build that up. But basically um, the same footprint just pulled back about four feet. And um, I, we went through the narrative with the other performance standards. But again, uh, it's riverfront. They focus on hardscape. The hardscape is going down about 72 square feet. Coastal Bank, you guys look at the hardscape, that's going down. Um, so it should be a, a relatively straightforward matter, but I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have them. Who your comments are? Yep, so I'll just show you guys some photos of the site. Um, top left, looking at the back side of the cottage. Um, another angle uh, on the top right. And then uh, moving over to the river side of the cottage, and you can see the hardscaping that Dan had described before. That's all going to get reduced. Uh, again, another shot uh, of the hardscape uh, brick patio and the closest point of the hardscaping to the riverfront. That's the Mashpee River in the background on the bottom right photo. Uh, the lot has been previously maintained, as you can see in the photo. It's, it's a combination of naturally vegetated areas and some lawn uh, going right up to the riverfront. Then you've got some pretty thick BBW back here. Uh, and then uh, some, some salt marsh beyond that before you hit the uh, Mashpee River. So going back into the uh, plan here, uh, as Dan described, it is pretty small scope, straightforward work dealing with the existing uh, footprints and reducing some of those hardscaping footprints. Um, <clears throat> all well set back from the uh, actual delineated riverfront. 
and Salt Marsh and BBW. So everything being contained in a previously disturbed, uh, developed area. Uh, as you can see from the photos, there's no impact to uh, any of the buffer zone to the riverfront that hasn't been previously and legally altered. Um, so let's see if there's any comments from Board of Health. Uh, not in a zone two water recharge area. No permit is required from Board of Health for the proposed work. So no other comments. Okay. Well, given that, uh, does anybody else have any questions uh, for the applicant? Dale, we'll start with you and go down as usual. Any questions, Dale? No. Pass. Tom? No questions, thank you. John? No questions. Paul? No questions. Chad? Can't. He's back. Oh, he's back. Okay. <laughs> Got a little lozenger or something and he can speak again. I, I have a million questions, but they really have nothing to do with uh, the application. I'm just curious <laughs> whether Dick Cook is moving closer to his uh, shellfish grid. <laughs> I think he is. I think he is, yeah. <laughs> But he doesn't appear to be storing anything on the property, so therefore uh, I have no issue. I will pass. Okay. Uh, let's see if we have a motion, Chad. Mr. Chairman, I'll have to uh, recuse myself on this one, or abstain rather, because I lost audio for most of the presentation. Okay, Dale, can you step in again? I move that we close an issue. I hear a second. I will second that. Thank you. Uh, and then, Dale, your vote is? Aye. And Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Yes. Dad? Well, abstain. Okay, you're abstaining, and I would vote yes. Okay, the motion has carried. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Right, Thank you guys very much. Take right. care now. Take care. We move on to James K. and Kathleen M. Miller at 105 Pompanesset Island Road for proposed hazardous and disease tree removal and mitigation with native plantings. Rebecca Perry of Gardens by Rebecca is representing the Millers. And I'm admitting Rebecca right now. Rebecca, are you on the line? Yes, yes, okay, yes, I are. am. There you are. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, there I am. Okay, there I am. Hi. There you are. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, I am Rebecca Perry, and I'm with Gardens by Rebecca, um, representing the Millers in this um, application for uh, removal of some um, trees in a couple of different areas of their property. Um, you should, yeah, there, we're looking at the, a plan that shows, um, um, let me get rid of this. Okay. This is my first Zoom um, meeting, so <laughs> very exciting. This plan shows um, colored in red uh, three different areas on the property where there's um, um, some issues with, with existing vegetation. And um, the applicant would like to um, make some make some changes, remove that, remove a few diseased trees, and replace some inappropriate um, plantings. The part of the packet that I submitted includes a, a, a evaluation from Peter Childs, the Childs Arborist, um, his inspection of the trees there in the back um, that that um, Drew is is pointing to. Uh, include um, one tree that has pitch pine, um, I mean, that has a turpentine beetle, um, and three additional pines uh, that have very little um, crown left on them. Uh, there was a, a year or so ago in one of these uh, bad storms, they lost one of a colony of trees there on the, the right side, right where his um, the hand is showing right now. Uh, there were there was an additional quite large tree there that came down in one of the big windstorms that we seem to be having now, and um, it was inspected by uh, 
my staff and they um, uh, gave them authorization to cut it up and, and remove it. But what's left is two trees with very little um, uh, foliage on them and quite, lo quite tall uh, trees that are, Peter, Peter refers to them as a, um, like a sail in a ship. Um, you know, the canopy is, is, um, is apt to um, blow and the potential for them to come over is, is significant. The tree over on the left side, the, the furthest left um, pine is the one that has the, uh, it's actually the next, yeah, okay, yeah, it's further over, uh, just to the right of the shed in the uh, lower picture, is the one that has the turpentine beetle. And um, so Peter also felt that that should come out just uh, for no other reason um, than you know, removing the, um, the threat of, of infestation of, of additional trees. And, and then the fourth, the fifth tree there is an oak that um, is in the foreground, just uh, again, the, bot, the lower picture with a shed that shows it's, it's that tr over to the right a little bit, Drew, that's the oak tree. And it, it, again, just because of the size of it, they, um, you know, um, were requesting its removal, but there's no uh, health issues with that tree. So uh, it's four pitch pine. Um, and then um, on the left side, the south property line of um, of this um, lot are three um, old overgrown Leyland cypress um, that you can see. Um, okay, we're, right now we're on the right. We're on the north property line. So those are um, some cedars that Peter has also um, determined have um, some issues with disease. Um, bark beetle, conifer bark beetle. Um, um, I'm trying to see what other uh, insect that he's um, pointing out. But they're basically pretty sick trees, and the millers are interested in removing those. So I believe there are um, five of those cedars on this north property line, and they'd like to replace those uh, as a screen. They're, currently, they're um, screening the next-door neighbor's house, and they'd like to continue their hedge of, uh, of arborvitaes there. And then on the left property line, which is the south property line, is where these Leyland cypress are. And they're just inappropriate trees to, in general that, that should never have been planted. And they're big and overgrown, and um, they would like to remove those and replace with um, a more um, suitable upper variety uh, giant of uh, three placatas. Um, and so that's the extent of, of their request. Um, any questions? I'm sure, um, I'm sure I may have left something out, so you'll tell me what I've missed, Drew. Okay. Um, Brad, I'll just uh, kind of... Please. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so you can see the commissioners, this particular lot is actually landlocked. It's not bordering any uh, wetland directly, <clears throat> but it is within land subject to coastal storm flow. So it's within the 100-year floodplain, and that is the jurisdiction on this lot because it's not bordering an actual water body. So the standard under the, under the bylaw is um, lands, uh, we have a regulation 25 which deals with land subject to coastal storm flow, which uh, has a standard of vegetation retention on a lot based on the lot's overall square footage. So starting at 5,000 to 10,000 square feet is 10% must remain naturally vegetated. Uh, or recapitulated as such, um, and then it goes up in 10,000 square foot increments, and it increases so from 10% from 5 to 10,000 square feet, 20% from 20 to 30,000 square feet, and so on and so forth, up to 30%. So, given, uh, just wanted to acclimate you all to the lot and the location, so you know what the jurisdiction is there. Um, and given what's proposed, and I had met with Rebecca on site, we took a look at these pine trees and the oak, and um, you know all the reasons presented for their removal are completely justified. And then you've got a lot of ornamental uh, amendments on along the property lines. Um, but overall, you know, point to this bottom right picture is kind of to show you um, there's a reserve area behind the property, and then there's some thick thickly vegetated areas on the property itself, looking at the top right photo here on this side. Um, so when you look at the at the overall percentage of this, which the retention rate, I believe, was 
twenty percent, uh, Rebecca. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the lot size was. I believe it, um, I think it was a twenty percent retention rate. I but, I think you're right. Yeah, but um, so in looking at what's proposed to be removed uh, compared to what's left behind, that percentage is most likely even exceeded. So it doesn't uh, violate the performance standards of Regulation 25 and the section therein that deals with landlocked lots subject to coastal storm flow. I'll tell the new commissioners that when you go th read through the regulations, that's one of the more riveting readings you'll come across. <laughs> <laughs> so have fun with that one. Uh, it's very detailed, it's very complex, and it's not very entertaining reading. So uh, having said that, uh, the project meets the performance standards for the resource area at play, and uh, I have no further comments. Do we have any comments from anybody else that has called in? Uh, nobody has called in on this application. Okay, so then we can ask uh, Dale if he has any questions. Dale? Pass. Bob? No questions, thank you. John. No questions or comments. Paul Colombo. No questions. Chad Smith. No questions. I have a question, Rebecca. Hi, how are you doing? Good, Brad. How are you? I'm good. A uh, question in regards to is the property line and the back that abuts the reserve area well delineated? Not on this plan, right? it's not. Uh, no. I do, I do not have um, it shown on this plan. Um, uh, I, we have a plan. I have a plan that shows it, I believe. But for I, I'm definitely uh, nervous uh, for the situation of are uh, any of the trees on the reserved land behind the, uh, the, the home of the Millers uh, endangered here by error, if nothing else. No, no, no. There's there's quite a bit of um, of of space um, between these trees and their back property line. That's why, for sake of, of the trees that have been cut down to make paper, I um, eliminated them from this drawing to save on on uh, on paper. So um, okay. um, no, this, this, there, there's little, no. The little strip of land lettered uh, what is it seventeen? is one of the most watched pieces of land probably on Papanesset Island, for sure, because it's a way to the water for various people, and mm -hmm. uh, it is closely watched, and there are people mm -hmm. watching it all the time. So that's why I'm just and, and this is to... Not anywhere near, not, there's no um, no concern that these trees are, um, are going to affect uh, even within maybe 30 feet of okay. that. Line. If you're talking 30 feet, then I, 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 I yeah. feel more comfortable, and we won't get any aggravation when you're working out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there? There was no questions from the uh, the audience, so therefore, what, what is our vote? And this is an R, this is an RDA. An RDA. Yeah. Okay. The, the motion is then to for the. The application of James K. and Kathleen Miller, it's an RDA. Uh, Chad, do you have a motion? Motion for negative determination on 105 Pompanusset Island Road. How about Dale? Second. Okay. And Tom, uh, well, let's go back to Dale for the vote. Aye. <coughs> Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Yes. Chad? Aye. And I vote yes as well. So the motion has carried. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. We'll move to 633 to KLK Starboard LLC at 31 Starboard Lane, proposed hardscape modifications, and a representative is Sean Riley from Coastal Engineering. Uh, Good Sean evening, for the record, Sean Riley. Co yep, Sean Riley here, Coastal Engineering. And Can you Sean, hear me all right? Sean, you're just yep. in the process of joining. We should see you, and you should see us shortly. 
Yeah, um, and I don't have a camera on the uh, laptop here, so. Okay, so you'll just be audio. I will just be voice. Okay. Well, uh, All right. just to go, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. I've got the GIS image up, and I'll move to the plan when you're ready. Sure. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, the resource areas on the site, land under ocean, beach, and there is a coastal bank. There's a V zone that hits the bank. The coastal bank is a man-made revetment, so it's essentially just a vertical buffer. Um, the scope of the project uh, is, is basically to retire and replace uh, some, uh, some old uh, landscape work. Uh, we've got a retaining wall that uh, borders the driveway. It's a two-tiered timber retaining wall. And we're looking to replace that essentially in the same location with a concrete retaining wall. Uh, rather than a terraced wall, it's going to be a single wall uh, essentially within the same footprint of the, the lower wall. Uh, in, the, in the same area, we're looking to at the same time reset the brick walkway uh, in that area with no expansion of the footprint of the walkway. Uh, on the south side of the house, there is a brick patio that we are looking to retire and replace with a stone patio with broad joints, uh, grass joints in between. Um, we actually have a reduction in the zero to 50 foot buffer for coverage and a slight increase in coverage in the 50 to 100 buffer. Um, all of that coverage in the 50 to 100 would remove lawn. So uh, there's a benefit there. We're providing a mitigation, and we can provide, we've got the landscaper that can provide a planting plan to Drew for final review prior to, prior to implementation. But uh, it's a pretty straightforward project, uh, all within the lawn area or the footprint of uh, existing features. With that, I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Drew, do you have any comments? Uh, just to photo, show you some photos, uh, you can obviously see that the house is going under some exterior work which didn't trigger any permitting with us, uh, just to preface that when you're looking at the photos here. Uh, so the retaining wall is kind of behind this trailer here. Um, I get a good shot of it on the bottom left. That's the tie retaining wall here we referred to earlier that's going to be replaced with concrete. Uh, the steps leading up to that brick patio walkway here uh, off the driveway on the top right photo. Get a look at the 50-foot buffer zone on the bottom right where you can see uh, just behind this hedgerow is a, the armored coastal bank, which I have a better shot of in a different picture. And you've got existing turf uh, leading up to the single-family home. Moving on to the next set of pictures, uh, this is the brick patio on the southern side where most of the hardscaping is proposed uh, in this area all over existing lawn. Um, and then, uh, again, looking on the rear of the house back towards the driveway on the top right photo, which you can't really see the driveway. It's occupied by the uh, debris trailer there. Um, and then uh, just another shot looking back. The top, top left and top right are just different angles of the same area. So bottom, uh, sorry, bottom left is um, looking back towards the coastal bank where most of that hardscaping is proposed. And the top left, again, looking from the coastal bank back towards the backyard uh, where the bulk of hardscaping is proposed. And then uh, just another shot over in the seaward side of the home where you can see the top of the armored bank uh, leading down to Vineyard Sound. There is occasionally a uh, coastal beach at the bottom of this wall, but mostly, for the most part, mean high water meets the bottom of the wall. Um, and a coastal beach comes and goes uh, every once in a while. So you could have part-time coastal beach as a, as a resource area here, uh, but it's primarily coastal bank and land under ocean uh, are the primary resource areas at play. So everything proposed is, is uh, no impact to those resource areas and mostly within the outer 50 to 100 foot setback and or taking place within uh, existing footprints and keeping those footprints with updated materials. So um, no other comments on this. There's no comments from Board of Health because their review was not triggered. And that's all I have. And nothing from the neighborhood or butters? Uh, nobody calling. No. Nope. Caitlin's very bored back there by the phone because nobody's calling.
right. Well, okay. That's interesting. But uh, let's see whether anybody else has questions. Dale? No questions. Tom? No questions. John? No questions. Paul? No questions. Chad? No questions. And I will pass as well. So, therefore, the motion uh, has passed, and this is a notice of intent. So, therefore, do I hear an appropriate motion? Um, motion to, um, well, sorry, um, close an issue. Close an issue. Yep, it's a notice. Yep. Second? Close an issue. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Okay, we got a second. Dale, your vote. Aye. Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Yes. Chad? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion has carried. Thank you very much, Sean. We will move on to uh, 630. Thank you all. Thank you, Sean. Southworth Properties LLC, 14 Grand Vista, proposed construction of a single family dwelling. Representative Mike Ball from Max Baxter Dye Engineering. Michael's got That's three in a row. Uh, Mike, I've just invited you. You should be showing up uh, shortly. Yes. Thanks, Drew. I'm, I'm actually, like Sean, I'm, I've got no uh, video tonight, so I'm just audio. Okay. Right, so I'm glad you can hear me. So, uh, good evening, uh, Drew, Chairman Sweet, members of the Commission. Uh, this is Mike Ball with Baxter Nye Engineering and Surveying. Tonight, representing the applicant Southworth Mashpee Properties, LLC. Uh, hey, first, I just want to say that your efficiency in moving through your 19-item agenda tonight is uh, pretty impressive, and I'll add that I am in no way sucking up to you in order to increase chances of project <laughs> approval. But uh, that was, uh, you guys have moved we'll along. We'll keep it in mind. We'll keep it in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so for this first project, I've got three in a row for you, and they're all very, very much the same. Um, this is 14 Grand Vista, located in Willowbend formerly known as 95, the height. Uh, the project is construction of a single family residence with uh, driveway, utilities, and landscaping amenities. Um, because this parcel is not yet sold, it is actually approval, seeking approval of a project area footprint that is uh, specifically being sought. So this is the same situation as with the previous notices of intent filed for this particular property. So. This very same footprint was approved by the commission in 2005. Uh, the applicant allowed the permit to expire in 2008. The second order was issued for the same footprint back in 2009. Uh, that, after an extension, that permit expired in 2019. So the applicant has returned seeking another order for the very same work footprint. Um, and of course, the applicant understands uh, that the approval granted uh, with the approval granted, there be a requirement for them to file a detailed landscape plan under an order of conditions amendment request. Uh, this is something that was done last couple for the last project on this road at Eight Grand Vista. Um, regarding the wetland resource areas, the project footprint lies in the outer 100 feet of riverfront area associated with, associated with Quaker Run. Uh, that's the river that flows to O'Brien's Cove portion of Shoestring Bay. Uh, the project narrative and alternatives analysis that you and P were provided demonstrates continued compliance with the riverfront area standards and the performance standards in your local wetland bylaw regulations. As you know, meeting the resource area performance standards means that the project serves the interests of both the Wetlands Protection Act and the Mass Pew Wetlands Bylaw. So, uh, DEP did issue the file number today and did provide a comment specific to ensuring that for projects in riverfront area that accessory areas around the residence be limited to areas necessary for construction of the house and any hardscape and any landscaping. And we expect this to be addressed when a definitive project is filed under an order amendment request. Um, last thing I'll add is being in Willowbend, this, uh, everything is tied into uh, the wastewater treatment plant over there. 
uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Drew, you have follow-up comments and questions? Yep, just uh, again, photos. Uh, not much really to glean here from uh, an undeveloped lot, So, uh, but your typical Cape Cod mix of oak pine forest with the um, combination of, you know, low bush blueberry, huckleberry, uh, partridge berry understory, and um, pretty much that condition leading all the way down to a transition into bordering vegetated wetland and ultimately riverfront. So most important thing to take away from this, uh, looking going back to the plan, is this riverfront uh, carries with it, you know, provisions that there is an allowable threshold of alteration up to 5,000 square feet um, in the outer riparian zones. So riverfront is divided into inner and outer riparian zones, 0 to 100 being the inner, 100 to 200 being the outer. As long as you adhere to that threshold of alteration and you provide a 100-foot uh, undisturbed inner riparian zone, both of which this proposal and the next two you'll hear accomplish, then it meets the performance standards for riverfront under both the bylaw and the State Wetlands Protection Act. The, um, the important thing to point out here with this particular application and the next two um, are that they're seeking at this point a building envelope and not uh, getting down to the level of detail as far as what the actual house will look like, what the landscaping will look like, what the hardscaping will look like, all of that will be conditioned if you approve this building envelope uh, to be submitted through an amended order uh, for, your for your review. Um, so those details will be forthcoming and that will be conditioned uh, if you approve this. The, the, the genesis of doing this approach is really to allow Willowbend to kind of show these lots to prospective buyers where they're not just looking at a thick forest, they can get kind of a, an idea of what, um, you know, the building envelope would look like. And along those lines, um, because it's kind of, it's, it's not what we typically see where we see everything all up front uh, as far as what's being proposed down to the last detail. That's, uh, that would be forthcoming in amended orders uh, subsequent to these filings for these building envelopes. The one thing that I would say, uh, Mike, and I, I know you've heard me say this before uh, in previous applications in, uh, in the same neck of the woods, is that when it comes to site pruning, you know, that we condition the permit to require an on-site prior to that happening and that it mostly be limited to the ground cover and the shrub layer and not the trees uh, until such time as that amended order comes forth with those greater level of details and you've got a, you know, Will event has a buyer and they're at that stage where they can provide those details. So does all of that sound reasonable to you? Well, to uh, just yeah. want to clarify. So you're saying after the after the or assuming the order conditions is issued, you just want to make sure that Willow Bend doesn't go out and do any clearing um, of any you know anything that would be construed as a vista prune, correct? Vista pruning or just wholesale you know clearing of all the trees. I mean, I guess it comes right. down to a question of you know how much do you really need to clear to give a buyer an idea of what to expect. You know, and so since we don't have any sort of timeline as to when these lots are being sold, um, I'm trying to avoid a situation where Willowbend, you know, clears too much above and beyond uh, that's necessary to demonstrate and show these lots. And so right. that's why I'm kind of, you know, looking at uh, a situation where the type of pruning that's going to take place be in close communication with staff so we know exactly what's, what's being cleared and it's not just wholesale clearing within this building envelope. I think, yeah. there, needs, I need, I think there needs to be a balance there, Mike, um, you know, where the buyer can see what they, are, you know, what they can expect and you're not just going in and continually clearing the lot until a buyer is found. So I think right. trying to achieve a balance there is really what I'm getting at. Do you think this will be something in, a, in the special conditions but kind of laid out in writing just so it's clear to the applicant? I do. Okay. I do. Yeah, I, I, I think they completely understand that okay. uh, that requirement. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not, you know, it's not something we, we typically see. And I know other uh, commission uh, have, you know, have approved this, but this is a whole new slate of commissioners and, you know, kind of a new outlook on things. And most of the commissioners here have seen these types of 
a lot of development projects with all the details up front, so it's not something they're familiar with. It's not something I'm familiar with, uh, so that we, we just want to proceed with caution. Yeah, and I, I, yeah. I want to, with, with my presentation, I just, I don't mean to be presumptive in any way that just because this was approved twice before, <laughs> right. it's going to get approved a third time, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of history, but I fully recognize that it's a different set of, uh, of, of serving members, so. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Uh, no other uh, comments. Okay. Does the commission have any comments? We'll start with Dale. Pass. Tom. Nothing. Thank you. John. No comments. Paul. Uh, I agree with Drew that um, anything that's going to be cleared should be clearly marked and approved by him prior to any clearing. Hey, not a problem. Uh, Chad, you have any questions? Nope. No, I, and I have no questions at this time. So we need a motion. This is an NOI. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to decline the motion on this one. Okay. Dale. I move that we close and issue. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. I think was that. I think that was a second. I heard. It was. Okay. Who made the uh, second? Okay. So I have it documented. I I did. True. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Dale, your vote. Aye. Tom. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. Yes. Chad? No. Okay. And I will vote yes. Okay. So that has passed. We'll move on to the next Southworth Properties project, which is 18 Grand Vista, which again is a proposed construction of family dwelling. And Mike Ball will speak to this one as well. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, Mike again from Baxter Night Engineering. As you said, this is this is 18 Grand Vista, which is the abutting property to the north. So very similar situation um, where it had an approval for a building envelope and a building footprint. Uh, that permit was allowed to uh, expire, and it ultimately was uh, approved again and then expired again. And so... We're back, just like the previous project, we're back, the Willowbend is back, or rather Southworth is back seeking uh, a notice of insurance. Um, so this is, again, a pro uh, property that's not been sold, but they look to, they will be looking to sell it. So there's no definitive um, uh, design. Uh, Drew kind of led you through the, the way things work over there, uh, or the way things they'd like to work over in Willowbend. Um, again, the resource area is riverfront uh, area. Um, we did submit project narrative and alternatives analysis to you and the DEP uh, demonstrating compliance with those regulations. Um, DEP did issue their final number today and uh, did add a comment regarding uh, limitations on the amount of area uh, around the project. Uh, limit, limiting that amount to only what is necessary. That's a, that's language in the Riverfront Protection Act uh, regulations. Uh, I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, so I, it's very similar to the last project. This one also will be tied into the wastewater, Willowbin's wastewater treatment system. Um, and with that, I will answer any questions. Drew, anything new other than what we had on the previous project? No, I'll, I'll just um, I'll just say that my comments from the previous project apply to this project, uh, and again, um, not much to glean from the photos. Same exact type of uh, <laughs> forestry makeup as the lot next door, obviously. So, um, the uh, no other comments. I guess I'd ask: Is the commissioners uh, yet to come? Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. For this, rather than do a roll call. I have, a, yeah, I have a question. Okay. So if that's the case, uh, 
if you're comfortable, we'll, we'll move to the boat. Well, they only no, have I have a question. Someone, someone has Brad? a question. Oh, you do. Who has a question, please? Dale. Um, I'd like to hear Chad. I'd like to hear Chad's reasoning for voting no on the previous one. Yeah, Dale, I can speak to that. I'm, I'm frankly uncomfortable with clearing land in any manner for uh, the purpose of well, making up for potential buyers that don't have an imagination. We're you know, we're just um, deforesting a segment of land um, for no reason. There's not even a buyer yet, and I think. Clearing land, though it's been approved before, uh, for this reason, I disagree with it. Okay, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm probably going to vote against this one too. I, um, I have to agree with you, particularly given it's, it is within the 200 foot riparian. They really should just leave it alone until they have actually have a buyer. Hey Drew, this is this is Mike. Can I make a comment, or would you want to finish with commission questions? Well, I would I would ask Brad, uh, Mike. Yeah. I mean, at, at this point, I think that that's the only question that is, has come up in the first uh, piece of property, and it's the, it's the same issue here. We're going to probably have the same issue again on the next one on the hearings. So the the, the big question, I guess, I hear is: Do we allow? Uh, the developer, because that's really what it is. It's a developer, it's not a homeowner. It's a developer, uh, a, a temporary owner, uh, allowing a lot to be cleared without any specific plans for its use. I think that's what you're really saying. Is that not? Do I encapsulate yeah. it right? There? Yes. And additionally, to um, speak to the interest of both the developer and conservation. Um, if they've, they've already got their permit to do one lot, uh, why do they need three for the sake of demonstration? I, I think that's a very valid point because that's where I was kind of getting to as we moved into the second one, asking if we can cut the corner uh, a bit. Uh, and I was doing it, uh, you know, just because the night is long. Uh, but you raise an excellent point, uh, you know. I would think that you ought to be able to do a, a little bit of bushwhacking uh, through that vegetation and see what's going on there. What is it that's on the other side? What is the river front really look like uh, that you're going to be able to see if you simply go in there and push your way through the underbrush to get to a few vista points? Through any comment in regards to my comment? Well, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... I was kind of having this discussion with with Caitlin, the assistant agent, earlier today, and that, you know, in a, as an alternative to you know showcasing these lots and therefore presenting a building envelope that they want to clear to present to prospective buyers to get an idea of what you know an ultimate house would look like. Are there any other alternatives to kind of show that you know even using modern technology, uh, virtual reality, you know something where you can overlay a GIS image and show, you know, various types of house footprints without actually going on to the lot and clearing. Um, it, it seems like a rather archaic approach considering uh, today's technology and showing, you know, what uh, lots could conceivably look like once they're developed. I'm, I'm wondering if there's any sort of technology out there that would make this sort of approach needless. Um, your thoughts, Mike? Maybe you're not prepared for that kind of question. Uh, but no, no, no. In fact, um, I, I've seen that. That I think it actually is called digital showcasing. Where, where? I mean, 2005. I guarantee you, they didn't have what they have now in terms right. of their abilities to quickly, like you said, kind of, kind of show us uh, what what a what a water view would look like without any trees. I, I think um, they, they have those tools at their disposal. Um, right. You know, so. I, you know, I don't think, even though we're, we're, this application is asking for the proof of a building or a work footprint, um, I don't believe in my description I proposed clearing following approval. Um, I know that's something Willowbend has done in the past over their many years of showcasing their lots, but I don't think it's something they would necessarily 
uh, be upset about if uh, if if the, there was a condition or the commission said no, we we'd like that you know we approve this building uh, envelope, but we will not allow any clearing until a definitive plan comes to us. So I mean, I, I guess I'm speaking on their behalf, but um, I, I think that's perfectly reasonable given the, the technologies that are that are available to showcase a lot. So I, yeah. I, I understand the, the concern by the commission for sure. Yeah, and I, and I, and I agree that there, there should be technology out there. I had, I had just kind of made the leap and assumption that they would be going in based on what they had done in the past. And, you know, if that can be avoided, I would obviously be in favor of that. And I know the commissioners would, would likely be in favor of that approach to anything that's going to preserve these conditions, you know, in the interest of the Wetlands Protection Act and wildlife habitat and not unnecessarily clearing when that kind of demonstration to a prospective buyer can take place without any of that uh, actual clearing taking place. So I think that, um, you know, maybe it'll involve some conversation with Willowbend. Um, like you said, you know, uh, hopefully they would be open-minded to it, but I, but I agree with the commissioners in their concern uh, 100%. I'm I'm wondering, and I'm just talking out loud here, that uh, I'm wondering, is it appropriate now for us to, so to speak, renege on what we just passed? Well, and, really, and, and, I don't know. Yeah. No, you can't. But the only thing, and Mike Mike said it earlier, is that nowhere in his pro project description did they actually say they were going to clear, uh, or even prune. So I think that it's really the one the application you previously approved was just for the building envelope, conceptually. Uh, okay. That's all it was. It didn't. There's nowhere in the application where it actually proposed to do any clearing. So I think, you know, moving forward with this application and the next one, keeping that in mind, you're really looking at it from an um, building envelope concept, uh, with the requirement of uh, an actual finalized footprint and all the landscaping and hardscaping that goes along with it, to be reviewed through an amended order, and we can even condition all three of these permits to say no cutting or pruning is to take place because it was never really specifically proposed in each of the project narratives. That would satisfy my uh, concerns, Bill. Yeah, I, I as well. I think the other thing that we, what we might do uh, is to proactively go and talk to, uh, you know, or have Mike talk with the, the engineering people at Willow Bend to find out have they pursued other technology to help them visualize what is going to happen, and maybe we could be proactive and try to help them help us. Yeah, I agree. Oh. Given that point, if, if we're comfortable with uh, with some a form of understanding what the words really are saying on the on the proposal, that we should then approve Grand Vista uh, and and the heights. Um, and because of the of the conversation that we've just finished. Well, sure, as long as can, we might we should condition it. You know, make it clear that there's no clearing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was I was going to say that if you're going to make a motion, make that part of the motion. For the record. Okay, so we we need to amend our previous approval. No. Oh, no, you can't, no, no, you can't go back, Brad, uh, but we can still condition that. We can still make it a condition. Even if you didn't mention it, um, it can still be a condition. Uh, okay. but, but we can't go I, back and I, change the vote on that. So you're focused on the one that's in front of you now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, have we got any other further questions in regard to this project, or should we call for the vote with conditions? Uh, just a comment, Brad. Uh, that's if we go back to the last one, that, that's was my concern that anything that's going to be cut was clearly marked and approved by Drew. And I, I think that would be the same situation here. I mean, if they can't do a virtual showing of these lots, then let them mark what needs to be taken down and then let us come back and approve that through our agent. Well, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have one law that, that there is no... A, a commission vote with a, con with a condition on it, and also um, they can come back and get an amended order. I think I think we should condition the, these this one and the next to, for no clearing. I agree. 
Okay, so for 18 Grand Vista and the Heights, we would we would approve with conditions uh, that are basically the same. Well, once we've heard the, the proposal for the Heights, we can talk about that one. Well, I would just focus on this one in front of you, Brad, and we'll get to the heights uh, after this. Okay. What is the commission's pleasure in regards to 18 Grand Vista? You want to? You want a motion to close an issue with conditions? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I will make that motion to close an issue with the conditions mentioned, the most notably. Um, no clearing until um, amended orders are received. Okay, is there a second? Okay. That? okay, well, let's go around the table again. If I may just interject, there is no public comment here in case you were wondering. <laughs> oh, I just couldn't wait. <laughs> no public okay. comment. Okay, <laughs> Dale, your vote. Aye. And Tom? Aye. John? Aye. Paul? Yes. Chad? Aye. And I will say aye as well. So the motion has carried. Uh, we will move to the heights. South Forest property 642 item on the agenda for proposed construction of a single family dwelling. And Mike Ball will talk about this see whether we can fit that into our new model. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, again, Mike Ball from Baxter Nye Engineering and Surveying. This is, as you said, uh, 89 the heights. Uh, it's, it's actually a few lots up from these two, the last two we talked about. Um, again, a single family house uh, being proposed, a uh, building footprint. Uh, specifically being uh, proposed as no definitive design for the house or the landscaping yet. Um, the resource area is a little different in this one. This one is also outer uh, riverfront area, but the buffer zone to the bordering vegetated wetland also extends onto this property. The, the outer 50 feet of the buffer zone does. The inner 50 feet of the BBW buffer zone is off the property almost entirely and there's no disturbance proposed. So that's really the, the difference here. So in the riverfront area, um, there's, um, my notes, we've got 4,500 square feet of, of disturbance in that building or that uh, work footprint that's being uh, uh, sought for approval. Um, similarly, this is going to be tied into the wastewater treatment plant uh, for Willowbend. Um, and similar history uh, project was approved back in 2005. It expired, got another approval, was expired, and then so now we're back seeking a, uh, another order of conditions to make the, the, uh, the, the property that much easier to sell for, for Willowbend. So again, another property uh, that's looking to be sold by the, by the applicant. Um, and I'll, I'll try to be, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. So I, um, I'll answer any questions you have. Drew, primarily we ask whether you have any questions, but this is a slightly different lot, so comment please. Um, it is a different lot, but my comments remain the same from previous, the two previous applications and that there be no clearing. Um, the performance standards are being met. You do have this, uh, secondary uh, setback line from BBW um, that is shown within the proposed uh, envelope area. But again, the inner riparian, inner 100 zone from riverfront is to be maintained in a naturally vegetated state, which meets the performance standards for riverfront. And because this line represents the 100 foot setback from BBW and not within the 50 foot setback to BBW, it does not trigger any mitigation from uh, the performance standards for watery vegetative wetland. So despite the change in resource area lines from this one uh, and the previous ones, uh, my comments remain the same. Okay, so what is the pleasure of the commission to, uh, if we follow what we did the last time, we will approve with conditions, is that correct? I'm happy with that. Do I hear a motion? Yep. 
motion for the Go ahead. yeah we'll, uh, close an issue correct yes <laughs> motion we close an issue with the conditions that clearing not be permitted until a finalized construction plan is presented I hear a second Dale thank you okay Dale your vote Aye. John uh, yes. Paul? Aye. Yes. Chad? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Okay. With that, we have to vote on a three-year extension request. No. Uh, you, already, you already voted on that, um, so you're good to go there. Okay. And so pretty much that's it. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a couple of uh, just very brief, I, I know you guys have been really patient and I appreciate it. Just a couple of updates real quick and I'll, I'll run through them, Brad, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So just briefly, um, the second bullet point on your pre-post agenda item, uh, update on the upper quotient restoration. We're getting ready to finalize our application with the Division of Ecological Restoration to get additional funding for this project. Um, John and Paul, I'll bring you all up, both up to speed on this. There's a lot to cover, too much tonight uh, for this project, but um, I'll bring you both up to speed on everything that's taken place. Um, so we, we, we're getting ready to submit that application to the Division of Ecological Restoration, and we've secured uh, letters of recommendation from most of the partners. Kate has worked very hard on the application, putting it together, and we should be submitting that uh, early next week. Um, Next update is, uh, as you already heard in previous hearings from Matt Costa this evening about the platforms associated with some of those projects and the 10A floats. I just wanted to, we've already been semi-updated about that in that we had a conversation with town manager, director of natural resources and harbor master to kind of hash out this plan to get a harbor management plan done for the town of Mashpee, for Pompanesset Bay and Wakoya Bay. And that would really kind of dictate how many moorings are going to go into a particular bay, which areas are suitable for aquaculture, how many 10A floats are going in, how is a harbor managed overall to preserve recreational interests as well as water quality. And that's really the gist of a harbor management plan. So the town is going to start turning the wheels on that uh, very soon. Um, last, uh, last thing is the... Um, Update on John's Pond and Santua Pond. As you know, we've had a lot of rain uh, up until recently, and there's been a lot of shoreline erosion, so we've been, you know, balancing, uh, trying to manipulate the water levels with the recent uh, emigration of the herring, uh, herring fish passage, and the high water levels uh, from a contract homeowner standpoint. So we've been dealing with that issue uh, and hopefully trying to strike that balance as best we can now that the rain is finally given us a window here, uh, the water levels have started to drop, and we recently made some repairs along John's Pond shoreline that had eroded uh, within 25 to 30 feet of the fish ladder uh, that we had DPW go and patch uh, as an emergency measure, because if it had gotten any worse, it would start to affect the stability of the ladder itself and the concrete around it. So that just gives you a snapshot of how bad the lake levels and the erosion has been uh, with this relentless rain that we experienced over the early uh, portions of the spring and late winter. Uh, everything seems to be stabilizing now, so that's good. And last, last thing is the endorsement. Uh, I just wanted to let you know I drafted an endorsement letter that had to be submitted today uh, for our Municipal Vulnerability Program, or MVP program, where it's a, uh, a state program actually using federal FEMA funds to improve municipal vulnerability in the face of climate change. So that's going to bring in more grant money for various types of projects around town, stormwater remediation, water quality, in a variety of different areas. And I just drafted a letter on behalf of the commission endorsing that program and the town's participation thereof on behalf of the commission. It was time sensitive. I didn't have time to ask permission for it. But um, I'll send you a copy of the letter. I'm sure you'll all be very Satisfied. I'm sure we'll be pleased. <laughs> and that's it. Thank that's, you. That's all I got. 
Thank you, Jim. Given that, I'll be glad to hear a motion. Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and second. The uh, meeting of, uh, what is it, the 11th of June is now Oh, you have, to, you have to take everybody's vote to adjourn. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll start. D Dale, you first, as always. Aye. Tom. Aye. John. Aye. Paul. It was sad, but I'll vote yes. <laughs> Thank you much. Chad. <laughs> Aye. And I will gladly vote yes as well. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Have a great weekend. Be well. Stay well. We'll see you in a Thanks, couple Thanks, Drew. Weeks. I'll be in touch. Okay. I'll be in touch, guys. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat>